I've always been a deep sleeper, the kind who could sleep through thunderstorms and blaring alarms. So when I began feeling unusually fatigued during the day, I decided to invest in a sleep tracker. The sleek wristband would monitor my sleep patterns, providing insights into the quality and duration of my rest. The first morning after wearing it, I eagerly checked the data. To my surprise, the tracker showed periods of wakefulness during the night with a significant amount of activity around 3 a.m. According to the device, I had been up and walking around for nearly an hour. I brushed it off as a glitch, assuming the tracker needed calibration. But night after night, the pattern persisted. Each morning, the device showed me awake and active during the early hours, even though I had no recollection of ever leaving my bed. Curiosity turning to concern I decided to set up a night vision camera in my bedroom. If I was indeed sleepwalking, I wanted to know. The next morning, I played back the footage with bated breath. The room was bathed in the soft green glow of the night vision. For the first few hours, all was still. But then, around 3 a.m., something startling occurred. I saw myself sit up, eyes wide open, but with a vacant stare. Slowly, I climbed out of bed and began to wander around the room, touching objects, pausing occasionally as if listening to something inaudible. After nearly an hour, I returned to bed, settling back into a deep sleep. The footage was unsettling. My sleepwalking self moved with a deliberateness that was eerie, displaying behaviors and mannerisms I didn't recognize. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I consulted a sleep specialist. He diagnosed me with somnambulism, a sleep disorder that results in episodes of walking or performing complex tasks while asleep. Stress, he said, was a common trigger, but there was something he couldn't explain. During one of our sessions, I mentioned the way I'd pause during my nocturnal wanderings, as if listening to someone. Intrigued, he suggested an experiment. We would conduct an overnight observation using sensitive audio equipment to pick up any sounds that might be occurring during my episodes. The results were chilling. During one of my sleepwalking episodes, the microphones picked up faint whispers, too soft to be discernible, but unmistakably human. The doctor was baffled, unable to provide a logical explanation. Returning home, I decided to delve into the history of my house. A deep dive into local archives revealed a tragic tale. A century ago, a young woman named Clara had lived in the house. She had been known to converse with unseen friends, often wandering the house at night, whispering secrets into the dark. One fateful evening, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The parallels were uncanny. Was I tapping into some residual energy? reliving Clara's nocturnal conversations? Was she the source of the whispers? Seeking closure, I reached out to a medium. She conducted a seance, attempting to communicate with any spirits present. As the candles flickered, she made contact with Clara, who revealed her loneliness and desire for companionship. My sleepwalking episodes, it seemed, were a way for her to connect, to relive her nightly wanderings, the medium helped guide Clara to find peace, releasing her from the confines of the house. That night, for the first time in weeks, my sleep tracker showed a full, uninterrupted night of rest. The experience left me with a profound sense of wonder and respect for the mysteries of the universe. It was a reminder that sometimes, the lines between the past and the present, the living and the dead, are more intertwined than we could ever imagine. I 
I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion. But I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away, up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old Forest Service ranger station and a newer double-wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I wanted to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night he told me he was cowboy camping, which means sleeping outside with no tent. And he kept getting a weird mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling, but no one was around him. He told me he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't sap, but he never slept outside there again, which leads me to believe he was telling the truth. For my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still. And I heard one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window and I didn't look up but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the heck outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice. I just lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually it stopped and somehow I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt too weird to ask. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it's still weird. Antarctica is not a place for the faint-hearted. It's a vast expanse where white and silence bleed into each other, rendering the landscape a blank canvas on which the mind can paint its deepest fears. As a research meteorologist stationed in McMurdo, I've braved conditions that would break a lesser soul. Howling winds, endless darkness, and temperatures that can freeze a man's spirit as easily as his flesh. But it's not the harshness of the climate that unnerves me. It's the whispers that come with the snowstorms. They're more than just auditory hallucinations. They've saved lives, including my own. You don't speak of them openly, those whispers. Antarctica has a way of humbling you, of making human words seem inadequate against its majestic and cruel indifference. But among the crew, we all know. When the snowstorms hit and the whispers come, you listen. It happened during a routine data collection mission. The sky had already turned an ominous gray, a storm brewing on the horizon, 
but we thought we'd have enough time. We thought wrong. Within minutes, visibility dropped to near zero, the snow a white haze that erased the distinction between earth and sky. The icy wind howled like a feral beast, gnawing through layers of thermal clothing. And then, through the cacophony, I heard it. A whisper so faint it could have been mistaken for a figment of my imagination. Left, it breathed, an ethereal wisp of sound snatched away by the gusts. My instincts screamed against it. Left would take us farther away from base, but something about that whisper felt different, like a thread of warmth woven into the frozen air. I looked at my fellow researcher, her eyes wide, her lips quivering with unspoken recognition. Did you hear it too? I mouthed. She nodded. Against reason, against logic, we veered left. The snow deepened, each step an effort that seemed to drain years from our lives. The whisper persisted, guiding us through the storm as if an invisible hand was carving out a path for us to follow. Straight, it beckoned. Right, it urged, each direction accompanied by a growing sense of urgency. After what seemed an eternity, the tempest began to recede as if the elements had decided we'd earned our reprieve. Ahead of us, barely visible through the lifting mist, was the outline of an old supply cache. Forgotten by time but marked on no current map, it offered temporary refuge and, crucially, a radio. By the time we were rescued, the storm had unleashed its full fury on our original path. Had we not veered left when we did, we would have walked straight into an ice crevasse, an abyss hidden by the snow, our bodies forever entombed in Antarctic white. No one spoke of the whispers after that, but sometimes, in the middle of a snowstorm, when human voices are drowned by nature's roar, I'd catch Sarah's eye and see reflected there the inexplicable. It's as if Antarctica itself reached out to guide us through its icy maze, as if the very air we breathed bore messages from an unknown sender. Does it make me question the science I've dedicated my life to? The empirical reality I thought I knew? No, but it makes me wonder about the hidden dimensions of the world, the inexplicable phenomena that lie just beyond our understanding. In the realm of Antarctic white, where the line between life and death is as thin as the edge of a razor, those whispers are a reminder of our vulnerability, our insignificance in the grand scheme. Yet they're also a testament to the enduring mysteries of the world, unquantifiable threads that weave their way through the tapestry of human experience. And it's in that delicate balance between knowing and not knowing that I find my humility, my awe, and the endless fuel for the questions that drive us forward into the unknown. It was a slow night. Halfway into my graveyard shift as a security guard, I found myself slumped in my chair, sipping stale coffee and watching feeds from the security camera. Monitors flickered in a rhythmic cycle through different angles of the hospital. Corridors, waiting rooms, stairwells. The place was a labyrinth after dark, silent except for the hum of machinery. My eyes were getting heavy when I saw it. Camera 12, third floor corridor. A shadowy figure moved along the wall, elongated and indistinct. I blinked, rubbed my eyes. The figure remained, inching closer to the far end of the hallway where it intersected with another. I glanced at the clock, 3.07 AM. Grabbing my flashlight and keys, I made my way to the third floor. Adrenaline cut through my drowsiness. Either somebody had breached security, or I was chasing phantoms. The elevator dinged softly, doors sliding open. I stepped out, 
flicked on the flashlight, and swept the beam down the corridor. Nothing. I checked the adjacent hallways, even popped into a few rooms. No sign of an intruder. Yet the unsettling sensation of being observed washed over me. I shook it off and headed back to the control room, a rational part of me figuring it was a camera glitch or a trick of the light. Back at my desk, I rewound the footage. The shadowy figure reappeared at the same spot, moving in the same direction, fading as it reached the hallway's end. No logical explanation came to mind. I logged the incident, noting the time and camera number, though omitting my eerie feelings. No need for people to question my sanity. In the nights that followed, I watched that corridor like a hawk. The figure never reappeared, but the memory lurked in the back of my mind, a puzzle with missing pieces. And though I still patrol the third floor, I do it with a quicker step, always reminding myself to breathe, especially when my flashlight casts long shadows on the wall. I had just settled into my comfy sofa, the long day's tension still clinging to my muscles. My hand found the remote, eager for some mind-numbing television. I pressed the power button and the screen flickered to life. What I saw made my heart drop into my stomach. There on the screen was me, or someone who looked exactly like me. Same hair, same eyes, same nervous habit of tucking a strand of hair behind an ear. She was in a well-furnished kitchen, laughing with children who looked a lot like how I'd imagined my own kids to look. Confused, I jabbed the channel up button. The scene shifted. There I was again, this time in a business suit, shaking hands with another woman in what appeared to be a swanky office. Channel after channel, the story was the same. My mimics living out countless lives, each more divergent from my own. I watched myself as a firefighter, a surgeon, a painter, a prisoner, all coexisting within the confines of the glowing screen. My mind reeled. This couldn't be real. Was my TV hacked? Was it some kind of prank? A marketing stunt for a new reality show? But as I looked closer, I realized that each version of me was subtly different. Distinct expressions, unique body language, varying tones of voice. These weren't cheap manipulations or deepfakes. They were living, breathing iterations of myself, unaware that they were being broadcast to an audience of one. The original, the outlier, the fake. I didn't know what to call myself anymore. Frantic, I grabbed my phone snapping pictures of each channel as if collecting evidence of a crime I couldn't yet comprehend. I sent a few to my sister Jenna, waiting anxiously for her response. Are you playing some weird game with me? She texted back. No, I replied, my fingers trembling over the screen. This is happening right now. I'm freaking out. Her reply took longer this time. All I see are regular channels, Nora. News, sitcoms, documentaries. Are you sure you're okay? I wasn't sure, not anymore. As days passed, I couldn't bring myself to turn off the TV. I was drawn to it, compelled to witness these alternate lives unfold. They were hauntingly fascinating, but also deeply disturbing. What did they mean? Were they alternate realities, glimpses into parallel universes where other versions of myself existed? And why was I the only one seeing them? My life began to unravel. Sleep became a distant memory, meals forgotten, social commitments ignored. The TV was a puzzle I couldn't solve, its enigmatic channels a labyrinth I couldn't escape. And then one evening, something changed. I flicked through the channels again, my eyes red, my attention wandering despite myself. And I stopped. There I was, or she was, rather, sitting on a similar sofa in a similar room. 
Her eyes met mine, a flash of recognition, or was it confusion, passing through them. For a brief moment, our lives converged. We were the same person, separated only by the glass of the television screen and whatever inexplicable force had entangled our realities. Then she did something I didn't expect. She picked up a remote and pressed a button. My screen went black. I sat there, stunned. My fingers trembled as they aimed the remote at the dark screen. Hesitant, I pressed the power button. Regular channels greeted me. News, sitcoms, documentaries. It was over, but the implications were not lost on me. That version of myself, that other Nora, had somehow ended the broadcast. She had the power to switch off her TV, and in doing so, switch off mine, to disconnect our entangled lives. I still don't know how or why it happened, and each time I turn on my television, I do so with a mixture of dread and anticipation, wondering if the fractured broadcast will return, and what it would mean if it does. I've gone back to my normal life, but the questions remain. Was I a spectator, or was I part of the spectacle? Did I witness a glitch in reality, or was I the glitch? Sometimes, late at night, when the world is quiet and still, I swear I can feel the eyes of the other Noras out there, all of us connected yet isolated, each pondering the same unsettling thought. When we looked through that screen, were we staring into a distorted mirror, or peering through a window to somewhere else? And if we were, what would happen if one day that window were to suddenly shatter? I can only wonder, and keep wondering, as I aim the remote at the TV and press the power button, my finger hesitating for just a moment longer each time. The energy of Mardi Gras in New Orleans was intoxicating. The streets bustled with revelers, jazz music filled the air, and the vivid colors of costumes and floats were a feast for the eyes. Amidst the celebrations, I found myself wandering down a less trodden path, drawn to the allure of a dimly lit curiosity shop. The shop was a treasure trove of artifacts, each with its own story, but my attention was captured by a mask hanging on the wall. It was beautiful yet haunting, a depiction of an old voodoo queen, with intricate beadwork and feathers, its eyes vacant yet compelling. A shiver ran down my spine as I tried it on. The world around me blurred, and I was thrust into a vision of a different era. The streets of New Orleans were still familiar, but the buildings were older, the people dressed in 19th century attire. I stood in a crowded market square, where a woman, regal and commanding, led a ritual. Her voice, powerful and melodious, chanted incantations as the crowd swayed, lost in a trance. It was the voodoo queen, and I was witnessing her in her prime, a pillar of strength and mysticism in the community. The vision shifted. I saw snippets of her life, intimate ceremonies in hidden bayous, healing the sick with herbs and potions and guiding the lost with her spiritual insights. As suddenly as it began, the vision ended. I was back in the curiosity shop, the weight of the mask pressing against my face. I carefully removed it, my hands trembling. The shopkeeper, an elderly woman with knowing eyes, approached. You've seen her, haven't you? She whispered. I nodded, still processing the experience. Who was she? That mask belonged to Marie, a revered voodoo queen from centuries ago, she explained. It's said that those who wear the mask are granted a glimpse into her world. With a mix of awe and trepidation, I decided to purchase the mask. It was more than just a relic. It was a portal to a bygone era, a testament to the enduring spirit of the voodoo queen and the rich tapestry of New Orleans history.
Routine is a life raft in the sea of existence, they say. For me, that life raft was flicking the living room light switch to on as I walked into my apartment each evening after work, until the day my raft capsized, leaving me floating in an ocean of uncertainty. I had just turned the key, pushed the door open, and flicked the light switch up. The ceiling light bloomed to life, but something else happened. As if choreographed to my movement, the view through the window morphed from a golden evening sky to pitch black. Instantly, it was night. I froze, my hand still hovering near the light switch. I blinked hard, expecting daylight to reassert itself, but it remained night outside. My eyes darted around the room, looking for some sort of rational explanation. Maybe a sudden eclipse? No, that was absurd. Heart pounding, I turned the light switch off. The room plunged into darkness, and I looked out the window. Daylight burst back into view, casting its warm glow across the cityscape. This wasn't a joke. This wasn't a trick of the light or a hallucination. My hand on that switch was flipping the world between day and night, like some sort of deity with an identity crisis. I felt both a surge of exhilaration and a gut punch of dread. I ran out onto my balcony, craving the tangible evidence of my senses. I flicked the switch off, then on again, standing there as the world outside obeyed my command. Day, night, day, night. There were no half measures, no dusks or dawns, just an abrupt transition. Cars on the street below came to screeching halts, drivers undoubtedly questioning their sanity. I could hear distant shouts, sirens beginning to wail. The world was noticing, and it was freaking out. I retreated inside, suddenly aware of the gravity of what I'd done. I was a bug that had wandered into the gears of the universe and jammed them up. I needed to tell someone, but who? Who would believe that I could toggle the sun and moon with a flick of my finger? Then I thought of Chelsea, an old college friend who was now a physicist. She was the closest thing to a genius I knew, someone who might at least entertain the reality of a glitch in the fabric of existence. My fingers trembled as I dialed her number. When she picked up, I stumbled through an explanation. Ryan, that's... Wait, I can see it the data. Something is oscillating at an unnatural frequency, like reality is skipping a beat. I thought it was an error, but if you're telling the truth... I swear, Chelsea, come over. I'll show you. She arrived within the hour, her eyes wide with a mix of skepticism and curiosity. I led her into the living room, gestured toward the window and the light switch. Watch, I flicked it off, then on. Day, night. Her eyes widened to saucers. Do it again, she whispered. Off, on, day, night. Chelsea's face went pale. You need to stop. We don't know what kind of stress this is placing on the laws of physics, on reality itself. You think I want this? I have no idea how to stop it. We sat in tense silence, trying to process the implications. Chelsea finally spoke. I have to report this. I'll keep your identity confidential, but this needs to be studied. Understood. F fixed. Okay, I said, the weight of it all sinking in. Okay, let's fix it. As she left to make the necessary calls, I sat alone, contemplating the enormity of what had just occurred. How do you live knowing you've broken the basic rules of existence? How do you move forward when every flick of a light switch could shatter the world? That's when I noticed the photograph on the mantelpiece. It was a picture of me taken on a hiking trip last year, except I was wearing a shirt I didn't own, standing next to a woman I'd never met. A picture of a moment that never happened in a world I didn't recognize.
I looked back out the window at the night sky, and for the first time, I noticed one star shining brighter than the rest, brighter than it should, and then it flickered like a faulty bulb on the verge of burning out. About 20 years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I worked as a window coverings installer in Sacramento, California. One day, I was sent with a large load of metal mini blinds to an active veterans hospital off Highway 50. I met the lead maintenance man, who thankfully loaned me a rolling cart to help make transporting my materials and tools a much easier chore. He then led me into the building through a maze of corridors and up a large service elevator. As we exited the elevator, I was pleasantly greeted with a completely empty hospital wing. I was happy to see that I had the entire floor to myself. No patients, staff, or furniture to constrain my mission. I could work quickly, without obstruction or distraction. The maintenance man explained how they just completed some seismic retrofits while pointing to some newly constructed drywall columns that concealed the brunt of their work. He said they took that opportunity to make cosmetic repairs, install new blinds, and give the place a much needed paint job. He then showed me a typical patient room and said there should be one blind for every window on the floor. He told me he would leave it to me and give him a call if I needed anything or when I was ready to leave. Last thing he said, in a concerned, fatherly voice before entering the elevator was, You sure you're going to be all right up in here? I responded, Absolutely, in my best, confident young man's voice. With a departing handshake, he entered the elevator cab. His question, and its tone, oddly hung with me as the doors and the whirl of the old elevator faded into a deafening silence. It was at that moment I was truly able to take in my surroundings. With the elevator to my back, I scanned the hospital wing in a clockwise direction. I was standing in the middle of a long rectangular room. Light and airy patient rooms filled the perimeter of the open room to my left. As I scanned right, the light quickly faded into an inky, opaque blackness that disappeared into a U-shaped corridor which, after a short distance, made a sharp right and another sharp right to end up back where I started. Despite the new paint, the place looked like it exited a time machine circa 1950, with those pea-green ceramic walls and matching asbestos vinyl floor tiles. It was at that moment that I realized this place was really creepy. But enough of that, I had a job to do and I got right to work. First things first, I walked the entire perimeter to get a quick survey of where things were located, popping my head into each room as I passed. As I got to the dark hallway, my bravery waned. Due to the lack of light, I presumed there must not have been any windows to address, but I pushed on nevertheless just to be thorough. As the darkness engulfed me, it felt like somebody plugged me into an electrical socket. I had never before or since felt the energy that surged through my body and immediately picked up my pace. Along both sides of the corridor were black rooms. After peeking in one, I abandoned my efforts for the absolute certainty that I was about to come face to face with something I did not want to see. I began to full-on run the rest of the distance until I was back in the main hall. Luckily, there was only one room within the dark corridor that had a blind I needed to install. The entire time I was back there, it felt like I had a thousand spectators, and I kept my eyes fixated on the doorway until I was done. The rest of my time in that wing, I was nervously on edge. 
The farther from the dark corridor I got, the slightly more at ease I became. However, I kept hearing distinct footsteps, bangs, knocks, a bucket being kicked and slid across the floor, muffled voices, and a phantom intercom that sounded like an old movie. With 100% certainty, all of these noises originated around me on that wing, despite there being nobody present. With each noise, I would pop my head out into the main hall, or say, hello? in what I'm sure was an uneasy voice. About halfway through the install, I finally stopped reacting, until I heard, hello, and my name, and I froze. Thankfully, it was the maintenance man, and I was super excited to see him. He asked how everything was going, and if anything eventful had happened. Not wanting to sound kooky, I sheepishly brought up some of the noises I was hearing. He abruptly said, Yeah, no kidding. This place is super haunted. I wouldn't work up here alone. He explained to me that the hospital had been an active war hospital, dating back to the 1940s, and there had been thousands of deaths in the operating rooms that lined that dark corridor. He also mentioned that an electrician walked out on them earlier that week, after something back there ran up behind him and growled. We joked around a bit to ease the tension, and then he left me alone once again. The rest of the day was surprisingly uneventful. Things seemed to have calmed down, and I felt calmer. I do remember never feeling more relieved to leave a place behind than that place, but also being completely exhausted that afternoon, and crashing out to sleep early that evening. To this day, it remains the strangest experience of my life. I've been a cog in the machine of corporate America for years, spending my days in a glass and steel structure that reaches skyward in a show of modernity. It's a building where elevators are usually prompt, taking us to our respective floors like well-trained horses. Yet there was something off about Elevator D, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck prickle every time I stepped inside. Most days it worked just fine, but every once in a while, instead of reaching my floor, the display would flash a zero and the doors would open. The first time it happened, I stepped out, bewildered, into what appeared to be the same building, except the air was thicker, tinged with the smell of cigarette smoke and stale coffee. Reception desk had an old rotary phone. The computers were bulky machines with cathode ray tube monitors, and the people, well, they were dressed like they'd walked out of a 1980s corporate manual. Suits with padded shoulders, men with mustaches that didn't seem ironic, and everyone engrossed in actual paper newspapers. I remember feeling disoriented, questioning my sanity as I wandered around the floor. When I got back in the elevator, it took me directly to my floor, in the year I belonged to, as though nothing had happened. I convinced myself it was stress, or maybe a prank orchestrated by the tech-savvy millennials in IT. However, it happened again, this time to my coworker, Lisa, who emerged from Elevator D with a look of bewilderment that I recognized immediately. We compared notes, verifying the impossible, that we had both traveled to the same bygone era our stories attracted a mixture of disbelief and awe and unease among our colleagues. We considered reporting it, but who would believe us? Elevator D became an enigma, a subject of jokes and nervous laughter. Some have claimed to have heard faint music emanating from its walls, the distant notes of a classic 80s rock ballad. Others felt a sudden drop in temperature as they passed it. But for me, Elevator D became an object of fascination, 
a tear in the fabric of reality that defied explanation. Each time the doors opened to floor zero, I found myself peering into a past untouched by the digital age, its people unaware that they were specters in a temporal anomaly. I never ventured far, never interacted with the people there. It felt intrusive, as if I were trespassing on a past that wasn't mine to disturb. So I'd linger near the elevator, studying the faces and fashions of a time I'd lived through but barely remembered, before returning to my own decade. The phenomenon continued sporadically over the years. New hires were initiated into the lore of Elevator D, although it remained unclear whether it was a technological glitch or something inexplicable. A sliver of another era sandwiched into our modern world. What does it mean, I still don't know. All I have are questions. Is Floor Zero aware of us, or are we just phantoms flickering in and out of their reality? Are there other elevators in other buildings that perform the same temporal magic? For now, Elevator D remains an unsolved mystery in a building otherwise dominated by logic and routine a vertical time machine encased in steel, forcing us to confront the ephemeral nature of time itself, a silent reminder that the layers of the past are closer than we think, hidden just beyond the doors that separate what is from what once was. I was born and raised on a farm in northern Michigan, a stretch of land that had been in my family for generations. Growing up, my father often told tales of curious and eerie happenings in the surrounding woods, strange noises, inexplicable tracks, and more. While he never spoke directly of the dogman, the local legends always seemed to lurk in the background of his stories. I shrugged them off as rural myths interesting tales to spook the younger kids. However, the events of last winter made me reconsider everything. We've always had a lot of animals on the farm, cows, chickens, and a few horses. Keeping them safe and well-fed was a part of the daily routine, one that had become second nature to me. That's why I was so alarmed when our livestock started acting uneasy. Cows refused to go out to pasture, chickens stopped laying eggs, and the horses seemed perpetually spooked. Then, one frosty morning, I discovered that one of our cows was missing. A search of the farm yielded nothing, just a set of unusual tracks leading away from the barn and into the forest, a mix of paw and hoof prints, large and unsettling. I followed them as far as I dared, but saw no sign of the missing cow or what might have taken her. My mind raced to the tales my father used to tell, and the grim realization that perhaps they were rooted in something real. A week later, the howling began. Long, eerie howls that echoed across the fields, chilling me to my core. I had heard wolves and coyotes before, but this was different. It sounded both animalistic and oddly human, a disquieting combination that left an unsettling feeling in my gut. Armed with a shotgun, I decided to keep watch one night, determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. Hours passed in tense anticipation, every rustle in the trees and shift in the wind raising my alertness. And then, just past midnight, it appeared. At the edge of the field, silhouetted against the moonlight, stood a figure unlike any animal I had ever seen. It was tall and covered in dark fur, standing on two legs with the posture of a man, yet its head was that of a dog or wolf, complete with glowing yellow eyes that locked into mine with a chilling intensity. The dog man. It had to be. Fear and disbelief gripped me, but before I could even think of raising my shotgun, the creature let out an ear-piercing howl and bolted into the woods, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. I stood there, heart pounding, shotgun trembling in my hands, 
questioning the very fabric of reality. The livestock remained uneasy in the days that followed, but there were no more missing animals, no more chilling howls in the night. Still, I couldn't shake the eerie encounter from my mind, and eventually I took to setting up extra fences and installing security cameras around the farm. I haven't seen the dog man since that night, but the experience has forever changed my perception of the woods that surround our farm. They say that legends are born from grains of truth, and I can't help but wonder how many other local tales are waiting to step out from the shadows of folklore into the harsh light of reality. Now I listen a bit more closely when the old timers talk, their stories laced with warnings and veiled truths. The fields and forests of Michigan are beautiful, yes, but they're also ancient and full of mysteries, some better left undiscovered. In the labyrinth of cubicles, the clatter of keyboards and the murmur of voices had always been comforting white noise. But when I stepped into the office that Monday morning, the sounds twisted into something unintelligible, alien. People were talking, laughing, engaging in what seemed like ordinary conversations. But the words were wrong. The language wasn't one I recognized. Each syllable an alien vibration that set my nerves on edge. I tried to brush it off, to chalk it up to some elaborate prank or perhaps a transient glitch in my auditory perception. But the feeling of dislocation grew with each interaction. Morning, Marco, my coworker Carol greeted. But her words emerged as an indecipherable string of sounds. Her face was friendly, her tone congenial. But her language was foreign, a melodic yet incomprehensible sequence of notes. I nodded, muttered a generic greeting in response, and hurried to my desk. Maybe if I immersed myself in the routine, emails, spreadsheets, reports, the strangeness would dissipate, replaced by the comfortable monotony of office life. But the anomalies persisted. Emails read like cryptic puzzles, their characters a jumble of unfamiliar symbols. Even software interfaces had morphed, their commands inscrutable. My little island of a cubicle felt like an outpost in an alien landscape. Desperation set in. I picked up my phone and dialed my wife, seeking the anchor of a familiar voice. But when she answered, her words were as foreign as everyone else's, a garbled melody devoid of meaning. Panic surged, a tidal wave that threatened to pull me under. I bolted from my chair and made my way to the office exit. But outside, the city had transformed into an even more disorienting tableau. Billboards, street signs, even the text scrolling across the side of passing news vans. Everything was in that incomprehensible language. It was as if the very fabric of my reality had been reprogrammed, leaving me an outsider in my own world. Days turned into weeks. Linguists were baffled. Neurologists found no abnormalities. Even as I yearned for answers, I grew to dread them. What if this was irreversible? What if I was stuck in this incomprehensible reality, cut off from everyone I loved, from everything I understood? I started to carry a notebook, jotting down snippets of conversations, fragments of written text. I pored over them every night, a lone cryptographer trying to decode a cosmic enigma. Each word was a clue, each sentence a piece of an intricate puzzle that, when solved, might grant me passage back to my old life. And as I sifted through the fragments, a pattern emerged. Echoes of my own language, hidden within the chaos. Like a distorted reflection, the alien tongue seemed to mimic the structures, the rhythms, the underlying logic of my own, as if it were an imperfect translation of my world into another. A reality almost identical, but fundamentally skewed. It was an epiphany, a sliver of understanding that suggested an unsettling possibility. Had my reality been replaced? Or had it simply been altered? And if so, by what? By whom? As I delved deeper into this dissonant reality, the boundaries began to blur. 
I found myself understanding snippets of conversations, grasping the meaning behind the written symbols. It was as if I were tuning in to previously inaccessible frequency, my senses adapting to this altered world. But adaptation came at a cost. With each new word I deciphered, a corresponding piece of my old language seemed to fade away, as if I were trading one reality for another, unable to retain both. As the days turned into months, I was left to wonder. What happens when the last remnants of my old reality are gone? When I have fully adapted to this new world? Will I even remember what I've lost, or will I simply become a native of this foreign reality, ignorant of the man I used to be? I don't have the answers. All I have are questions, and a growing sense that I'm caught in a tide of transformation that's far from over. And as the alien syllables become increasingly familiar, as the foreign text begins to read like my native tongue, I'm left to ponder the nature of my new reality and to fear what it might become. I decided to go on a solo camping trip in the woods of Eastbrook, Maine. I have been going through some stuff recently and figured that nature would be the perfect escape. I did my research, chose a site, and packed my gear. I was aware of some local legends about the Eastbrook Harpy, but I figured it was all folklore, something to spook the kids. I set up camp in a secluded spot pretty far from the nearest road. The first day was wonderful. I hiked, cooked some food over a fire, and watched the stars come out. As night fell, I crawled into my tent and settled in for a peaceful sleep. Then I heard it. Around midnight, the forest erupted into this blood-curdling scream. It wasn't an animal. I know what bears and coyotes sound like. This was something else. Something human, but twisted. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent a bit to take a look. What I saw next will haunt me forever. About 50 feet away, illuminated by the moonlight, was this figure. It looked like a woman, but her eyes were glowing a faint yellow. Her arms were elongated, with fingers that were way too long. And then she opened her wings. Yes, wings. Feathered, massive, and horrifying. She let out another scream, and then soared upward, disappearing into the tree canopy. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. As soon as the sun came up, I packed my things and hightailed it out of there. The thing is, when I got back to my car, there were scratch marks all over it like something had tried to get in. I've done some digging since I got home, and I found old newspaper articles about sightings of the Eastbrook Carpy. The descriptions match what I saw. This thing has been spotted by locals for decades. I don't know what's out there, and I can't explain what I saw, but I know I won't be going back into those woods alone. I'm even considering selling my camping gear. Be careful out there. You never know what's lurking in the woods. I'm a photographer, and Monument Valley in Utah and Arizona was on my bucket list for the longest time. Famous for its iconic red mesas and starry nights, it's a dream spot for anyone who wants to capture the beauty of the American Southwest. My trip was going perfectly fine. By day, I captured the raw beauty of the land, but I was mostly excited for the night to get some long exposure shots of the night sky against the valley silhouettes. As the sun dipped and painted the sky with hues of orange and purple, I set up my equipment on a slightly elevated vantage point. 
Just as the first stars began to appear, a soft, melodic hum filled the air. It seemed out of place, yet oddly harmonious with the desert ambiance. And then, right between the famous mittens, those iconic rock formations you often see in pictures, a series of luminescent spirals began to form in the sky. They danced and intertwined, forming patterns that were hypnotic to watch. But here's the thing that got my heart racing. These patterns began to reflect on the ground, as if there were invisible mirrors in the sky. Curiosity transformed into unease when I realized that the spiral seemed to be descending slowly, getting denser and more vibrant. I could now hear faint echoes, almost like distant conversations, but in a language I had never heard and couldn't comprehend. My camera, which was set for long exposure shots, captured all of this. But when one of the spirals started moving toward me, I decided that I had had enough. I quickly packed up my equipment and drove out of there as fast as the rough terrain allowed. The next day, after putting some distance between me and the valley, I reviewed the photographs. To my shock, instead of the spirals, the photos showed ghostly silhouettes of humanoid figures, each connected by beams of light, as if communicating by them. I shared the photos with a native friend of mine, and he went silent for a while. When he finally spoke, he said those lands have always been sacred, and there are tales that span generations. Tales of beings from the stars who once visited. Now, I don't know if I captured proof of an ancient tale or if the desert just played tricks on my mind. All I know is Monument Valley holds mysteries deeper than the valleys themselves. If you've ever been there and experienced anything out of the ordinary, please share because I'm still trying to make sense of that night. I had always prided myself on being rational, even keeled. You have to be when you're a maintenance technician in a sprawling facility like St. Augustine's Hospital. You troubleshoot electrical issues, fix leaky pipes, and ignore whatever local legends float around the place, except for the unexplained breezes in the West Wing. When I mentioned the cold drafts to Carol, the senior nurse who'd been at St. Augustine since the days of dial-up internet, she leaned in. Oh, yeah. They come and go. You get used to it. That was easier said than done. The West Wing had been closed off for years, a relic of older, less efficient designs. Budget cuts, someone had mumbled once, but who knows. Despite its emptiness, it was my responsibility to make periodic checks for structural issues, leaks, and electrical faults. The first time I felt the breeze, I was at the end of one of those routine checks. My hand was on the door, ready to leave the derelict wing when it happened. An inexplicable blast of cold air hit me, snaking its way down my collar, chilling me to the bone. The air was still, windows were bolted shut, doors sealed. There was no rational explanation for it. I tried to dismiss it, to chalk it up as one of those quirks old buildings have. But then it happened again, and each time the breeze seemed to last longer, to feel colder. It became a distracting, unsettling mystery that I couldn't ignore. I even pulled up old blueprints of the hospital, trying to find some architectural explanation. Air shafts, hidden vents, anything. I found none. Determined to solve the puzzle, I decided to stay overnight in the West Wing. If there was a pattern to the chill winds, I was going to find it. Armed with thermal sensors and a high definition camera, I set up my equipment in the center of the wing. The night stretched on, endless and uneventful, until about 3 a.m. 
Just as I was questioning my own sanity for doing this, the temperature readings on my thermal sensor plummeted. A chill wind, stronger than any before, howled through the corridor. Papers scattered, old window blinds clattered against the walls, and I was engulfed in a cold unlike anything I had ever felt. I grabbed my camera, fingers trembling, and scanned the room. But there was nothing. No visible source. Just the icy gusts battering against me, as if pushing me away, out of the wing. When the winds finally ceased, I was left standing there, disoriented and chilled to my core. The thermal sensors normalized, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had trespassed into something I didn't understand. I packed up my equipment, my movements robotic. I couldn't wait to leave. But as I reached the door to the exit, I hesitated. My camera lay on the table, its lens staring back at me. I played back the footage, fast forwarding through hours of nothingness, until I reached the moment when the winds began. There it was, the paper scattering, the blinds clattering. And then I saw it, a shadow, fleeting and barely discernible, moving against the current of the wind not with it. It was as if something had walked through, passed by me, unnoticed and undisturbed by the laws of physics. I never spoke of it, never showed anyone the footage. What could I say? What rational explanation could I offer? But I knew I couldn't go back to that wing, not alone, maybe not ever. Months passed and the West Wing became a distant concern, buried under the weight of more immediate issues. It became easier to ignore, easier to forget. But the air in the hospital changed, sometimes subtly, sometimes noticeably. A cold draft would pass through a crowded hallway, or a sudden chill would fill a warm room. Nurses blamed the air conditioning and doctors shrugged it off. Only I knew that something had left the West Wing, something that defied explanation. And while the icy winds in the derelict wing had ceased, they now seemed to wander the hospital freely. I often find myself wondering where the chill will appear next, whether it's aimless or searching for something, something that perhaps only it understands. And so the hospital's pulse continues, now with a cold breath that reminds me that there are things in this world that remain beyond understanding things that you can neither repair nor explain. Belarus, a country known for its rich folklore, replete with tales of spirits and otherworldly beings, was never a place I associated with the supernatural until my own peculiar experience. I was in the small village of Kasava for a cultural festival. The quaint town was a hive of activity, with locals dressed in traditional attire, artisans displaying their wares, and musicians playing folk tunes. However, the centerpiece of the event was a dramatic reenactment of a famous Belarusian legend about the Rusalka, a type of Slavic water nymph or mermaid known for luring men to their watery graves. As darkness enveloped the sky, a group of performers gathered around a bonfire near a pond at the edge of the village. They performed the tale with captivating intensity, their voices mingling with the flickering flames and reflecting off the still water. The story concluded with a warning Never walk near the water alone at night, or the Rusalka may take you. After the event, the crowd dispersed, but the story stayed with me, echoing in my thoughts. I decided to take a brief walk to clear my head before heading back to my lodgings. I found myself drawn to the pond where the performance had taken place. The night was calm, the air filled with the scent of damp earth, and blossoming flowers. I stood at the edge of the pond, watching the moon's reflection dance on the rippling water. 
Then I heard it, a soft, melodious singing, so ethereal that it seemed to come from the depths of the pond itself. My rational mind told me it was a trick of the wind, or perhaps some local enjoying the solitude. But another part of me recalled the legend of the Rusalka. The singing grew louder, more insistent, and I felt an inexplicable urge to step closer to the water. Just as my foot hovered over the edge, I felt a firm grip on my shoulder. Startled, I turned to see an old woman, her eyes filled with a mix of relief and warning. Never listen to the songs at night, she whispered, her voice tinged with urgency. The Rusalka is real and she lures souls. Go back to the village, young one. This is no place for you. The singing abruptly stopped as if the pond itself had heard the old woman's words. I thanked her, my heart pounding with a mixture of fear and gratitude, and made my way back to the village, the weight of her warning settling deep within me. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the experience at the pond left a lasting impression. I can't say for sure whether the Rusalka is real or merely a figment of collective folklore, but that night in Kasava, I felt something, a presence, a lure, a glimpse into the unknown. Whether folklore or fact, the legends of Belarus now hold a very real place in my understanding of the world, a haunting reminder that some ancient tales may carry more truth than we dare to admit. When I took a teaching job in Guanajuato, I was enthralled by the city's rich history, colorful streets, and the maze-like tunnels that snake beneath the surface. However, I was not prepared for the legend of La Luz de Guanajuato, or the light of Guanajuato. Locals often spoke of an ethereal light that sometimes appeared in the city's old cemeteries and narrow alleys, guiding lost souls or leading others astray. It was said to be the manifestation of the tormented souls who perished during the time of the wars or during the Spanish Inquisition. I took these stories with a grain of salt until my colleague Mariana invited me to an All Souls Day gathering at her family's home. The night began with a visit to the Panteon Antiguo, one of the oldest cemeteries in the city to pay respects to her ancestors. We light candles not just to remember the departed, but to guide their souls and ours through the darkness, Mariana explained. After the visit, we walked through a dimly lit alley to reach her home. That's when I saw it, a soft golden light hovering a few feet above the ground. It was different from the flickering glow of the candles we had just lit. This light seemed alive, pulsating gently in the night air. La Luz de Guanajuato, Mariana whispered, her eyes widening. Quick, make a wish, but don't speak it aloud. I closed my eyes, half in disbelief, and made a wish. When I opened them, the light had vanished. We continued our walk in silence, each absorbed in our own thoughts. Mariana broke the quiet by saying, you know, they say that if La Luz appears to you, it means you have an unresolved matter that needs attention. Her words struck a chord. I had been grappling with the decision to extend my teaching contract or return to my home country to take care of my ailing father. Seeing the light of Guanajuato felt like a nudge from the universe, urging me to confront the issue I'd been avoiding. The next morning, I called my father. Our heartfelt conversation revealed that he was more understanding of my situation than I had given him credit for. His words dispelled my guilt, and I decided to extend my stay in Guanajuato. Weeks later, I visited the Panteon Antiguo again, this time alone. I lit a candle and whispered a prayer of gratitude, half hoping to see La Luz once more. While the mysterious light did not appear, the feeling of relief and direction it had given me 
was palpable. That experience became a defining moment of my time in Guanajuato, a mystical encounter that lent clarity to my earthly dilemmas. Whether it was a figment of local folklore or a true spectral phenomenon didn't really matter. What did matter was that it guided me, much like the many stories and legends that have guided the people of this enchanting city through centuries of darkness and light. At the station, there was this old gear collection, a makeshift museum of firefighting history. Helmets, hoses, and nozzles from decades past were arranged in a glass case near the entrance. Among them was a classic leather helmet, one that had belonged to a firefighter who died in the line of duty in the 1980s. I'd never paid it much attention, until one day when my standard issue helmet was damaged during training. While waiting for a new one, I took the old leather helmet from the display, just to cover shifts until the replacement arrived. It looked worn but sturdy, a relic from a bygone era that had seen its share of flames. The first time I put it on, I heard them, distant cries for help, coming from a direction I couldn't pinpoint. We were at the station, not out on a call. My buddies lounging around me heard nothing, their conversations rolling on uninterrupted. I took the helmet off, and the voices vanished. During a house fire two days later, it happened again. Amid the crackling of burning wood and the hissing of water jets, I heard the cries. They were desperate but distant, as if floating from some far-off dimension. I told my crew, but they brushed it off, attributing it to the stress of the job, or maybe some strange acoustics. It wasn't just cries. Sometimes I heard fragments of conversations, urgent snippets like, this way, or can't hold on much longer. I knew it wasn't radio interference. It was something else, something deeply unsettling. My skepticism started to wane. After each shift wearing the helmet, I found myself researching old fire incidents, trying to identify the source of the voice, the hidden tragedy that seemed to be crying out for recognition. I came across news articles about the firefighter who originally wore the helmet a guy named Mike, who died rescuing a family trapped in a burning apartment building. His body was found near the children's room, almost as if he'd been trying to make one final heroic act. I couldn't escape the thought that Mike's presence, or some echo of it, remained in that helmet. I felt as if I were being guided or warned, though I couldn't tell which. It was as though the cries were drawing me closer to something I couldn't quite grasp. The last time I wore the helmet, we were called to a massive fire at an old factory. It was a difficult operation, full of risks and unknowns. Inside, through the dense smoke and intense heat, I heard the cries again, this time more distinct, more urgent. They seemed to emanate from the heart of the inferno, from a place no one could survive. Guided by the voice, I discovered a man trapped under debris. It was in an area we hadn't searched yet, a place we might have overlooked. As we pulled him out, I heard the voice one last time, a faint whisper that sounded like, thank you. After that night, the voices stopped. My new helmet arrived, and I returned the old one to its glass case, next to the faded photographs and memorabilia of firefighters past. I often look at it when I walk by, feeling a strange mix of gratitude and mystery that I can't fully explain. But deep down, I believe Mike had something to do with it. His final act of heroism from beyond the grave. It had been a long day at work, one of those days where every tick of the clock feels like a jab to the ribs. All I wanted was to slide into the subway seat, zone out, and make it home. The doors whooshed open, 
and I stepped onto the train without even glancing up from my phone. But when I did look up, the world seemed to freeze around me. Every face on the train was mine. They were all sitting there, each version of me occupying the seats, gripping the poles, even leaning against the doors. Some wore the same expression of weary fatigue that I felt. Others were engrossed in books or staring at their phones, but they were all unmistakably me. My breath hitched. Was this some elaborate prank? Virtual reality? My mind scrambled for an explanation, but came up empty. The train jolted into motion, forcing me to grab a pole for balance. My eyes darted from one face to another, each pair of eyes, my eyes, locking onto me with varying degrees of shock or curiosity. Next stop, 23rd Street, the intercom announced, but the voice was my own. The other me's began to whisper amongst themselves, each conversation like an echo chamber of my own thoughts. Words like glitch and reality floated in the air, merging into an indecipherable murmur. One version of me, seated near the door, patted the empty seat next to her. Hesitant, I walked over and sat down. Up close, I could see the tiny details that made us identical. The same mole on the chin, the same chipped nail polish. Any idea what's going on? She asked. Her voice was as familiar as my own thoughts. I was hoping you would know, I said. A heavy silence followed, punctuated only by the screech of the subway against the rails. 23rd Street, exit for Chelsea and Madison Square, my voice announced through the intercom as the train pulled into the station. The doors opened, but no one moved. Who would? Stepping off this train felt like stepping off the edge of reality. The doors closed, and the train moved on. As the minutes ticked by, the atmosphere grew tense. Some of my clones began to pace the car. Others were in heated discussions, gesturing wildly. A few even seemed to be in tears. We were a microcosm of emotions, each one amplified by its reflection in the others. Next stop, into the line, the intercom said. That wasn't right. There should have been at least three more stops before the terminus. A collective sense of dread filled the car. The train pulled into an unlit station, the walls of which were pure black as if they were made from darkness itself. The doors opened. On the platform stood another version of me, her eyes filled with a calm, almost serene authority. She spoke without boarding the train. This is where you get off, all of you. This is the end of the line. The other me's began to exit the train. I followed suit, stepping onto the dark platform. It was cold here, as if the very air was devoid of life. Is this, what is this place? I asked the version of me on the platform. She looked at me, her eyes like bottomless wells. It's a nowhere place between the cracks of reality, she said. And now that you're here, there's something you all need to do. And what's that? I asked. Choose. Choose what? Who gets to go back? A hushed silence descended on the platform. Go back? Go back to what? To being the only one? The only me? Only one can return, she continued. The rest will stay here, in the nowhere place. Arguments erupted around me. How do you fight for your own life against yourself? How do you prove you're the real one when everyone is a perfect copy? Then it hit me. The coat I was wearing, a new purchase just this morning, a coat none of the others wore. It was a small detail, but in a situation where everything was an echo, it made me the original. I stepped forward. I'm the one who should go back. I'm wearing a coat none of you have. It proves I'm the original. The authoritative me looked at me, her eyes softening. Very well she said, and with a wave of her hand, the world around me started to dissolve in a swirl of colors. When I came to, I was back on the train, pulling into my regular stop. This time, the faces around me were their usual mix of strangers. 
Trembling, I exited the train and climbed up the stairs to the street level. As I reached the top, my phone buzzed. A message from an unknown number flashed on the screen. It read, nice coat, it suits you well. I looked around, my eyes scanning the crowd. Then I saw her a few yards away, disappearing into the throng of people. Me, wearing the exact same coat, her eyes meeting mine one last time before she was swallowed by the city. The air had a sharp chill as I wandered through the dense forest of Belarus, not far from the village of my grandmother. I had often heard stories of the mischievous spirits and entities that lurked in these woods, but like most of the younger generation, I dismissed them as tales to keep children from wandering too far. The day had started sunny and cheerful, but as evening approached, an eerie fog settled making visibility almost non-existent. Despite my logical mind, I felt a shiver of unease. The stories of my childhood echoed in my ears. The Zedka, forest spirits that could lead you astray or reward you. And the Pulevic, spirits of the fields that appeared at noon and sunset, sometimes harmful and sometimes benign. Walking slowly, my shoes crunched on the leaves, but then I heard a different sound, the soft, delicate laughter of a child. Thinking it was perhaps a villager's kid lost in the woods, I called out, hello? The laughter continued, leading me farther and farther away from my known path. It seemed like hours had passed when I finally reached a clearing. There, in the middle of the clearing, stood a circle of ancient stones, each covered in moss. In the center of the circle, a young girl with pale, almost translucent skin and wearing a white dress danced, her laughter echoing around her. As she turned, her eyes met mine. They were an unnatural shade of green. She beckoned me forward. I felt a magnetic pull but deep inside, a voice screamed for me to stay back. The girl seemed to embody both innocence and malevolence. I've been waiting for you, she whispered in a voice that seemed older than her appearance. Come dance with me. Entranced, I took a step forward, but suddenly a loud caw broke the spell. A raven landed on one of the stones, its eyes fixed on me. It cawed again, more urgently this time. The girl hissed, her face distorting into something less human, more sinister. Leave, she screamed at the bird, but the raven merely cawed louder, flapping its wings aggressively. Shaking my head, trying to clear the fog from my mind, I backed away from the circle. The girl's scream pierced the air as she began to vanish her form dissolving into the mist. The raven, now calm, hopped down from the stone and transformed. Before me stood an elderly woman with silver hair, her voice lined with wisdom and age. She sighed deeply. Young one, you were almost ensnared by the Zedka. She tries to trap souls, making them dance for eternity. I am a guardian of these woods and the ravens are my allies. You must be more careful and respect the spirits, both good and evil. Feeling shaken and overwhelmed, I nodded. Thank you, I whispered. She gave a gentle smile. Remember the tales of your ancestors. They hold truths and warnings. With that, she transformed back into a raven and flew away. I quickly made my way back to the village my heart racing. The stories of my grandmother were not mere tales. They were rooted in the very soil of Belarus. And from that day on, I listened to those tales with newfound respect and awe.
Real estate websites are a guilty pleasure of mine. There's something intriguing about scrolling through properties, imagining different lives in different places. But when I stumbled upon my childhood home listed for sale, nostalgia washed over me like a tidal wave. It was the same two-story suburban house on Maple Lane, its walls once a pale blue that mirrored the sky on a sunny day. The same place where my mom had planted roses in the garden and where my dad taught me how to fix a bike. I clicked the link, eager to explore the familiar spaces through virtual pictures. But what I found shattered my expectations. Every photo showed a burned out husk, a ruin charred black by fire, windows blown out, the remnants of a life reduced to ashes. It was my house, unmistakable in its structure, but annihilated in some cataclysmic event. Confusion gripped me. How could this be? My family had moved out years ago, but we had sold the house intact, in good condition. There was no fire, no disaster that I knew of, so why did it look like this? I frantically checked the date on the listing, thinking maybe something recent had occurred. But the date only deepened the mystery. It was from years ago, before we even lived there. My heart pounded in my chest as I explored other resources. Historical photos, property records, news archives. The story was always the same. No matter how far back I went, Every image showed the house as a burned ruin. It was as if history had been rewritten, erasing the peaceful years my family had spent there, leaving only ashes and questions. But the anomalies didn't stop there. I found an old neighborhood forum, conversations dating back to the time we lived there. People mentioned the burned house on Maple Lane, recounted legends and rumors about it being haunted cursed. They talked about seeing strange figures in the windows, hearing whispers at night. Some claimed it had been a site of ritualistic activities, a gateway to something darker. Except I had lived there. It was my home, my sanctuary, and none of those things had ever happened. No fire, no haunting, no dark rituals. Just an ordinary house on an ordinary street. Or so I'd thought. Something compelled me to dig deeper. I contacted the current listing agent, pretending to be an interested buyer. I asked for more details, mentioned the state of the property in the pictures. The agent was perplexed. He assured me the house was in excellent condition, that there had been no fire, no damage. I pressed him to send me current photos, my pulse racing as I waited for his reply. When the photos arrived, they showed the house as I remembered it. Intact. Inviting. A place you could call home. Nothing like the burned ruin that seemed to exist everywhere else. Relief and horror fought for control as I grappled with this conflicting reality. Was the house on Maple Lane a burned ruin? A haunted place steeped in dark legends? Or was it the home where I grew up? Where my parents laughed? And where I played with childhood friends? And what did it mean that two such disparate versions could coexist, each real in its own way, each backed by evidence that couldn't be ignored? I never bought the house. I couldn't. But I couldn't let it go, either. And so, every so often, I find myself going back to that listing, looking at those haunting pictures of a home that both was and wasn't mine. I listen for whispers in the stillness of the night, half expecting to hear the echoes of a past that might have been, a past that might yet be. I think about visiting, about standing in front of the house to see it with my own eyes, but I hesitate, afraid of what I might find, of which version will manifest for me. And the question haunts me, a riddle with no answer. Which house is real? And what will it become when its reality finally catches up with mine? The mystery remains, and the only thing I know for certain is that I'm caught in its web, suspended between two histories, two truths, two lives, and I'm left to wonder, 
What happens when those diverging realities finally collide? The piercing shriek of a monitor alarm jolted me awake. I rushed down the hall to room 309, the source of the commotion. Rounding the corner, I saw the patient's heart monitor flashing a flat green line. Code blue, I called out. The rapid response team mobilized within seconds, crashing through the door prepared to resuscitate the patient. But as we entered, we found the patient sitting up in bed, very much alive and very confused, breathing normally. He looked at us bewildered as his monitor continued to show no heart rhythm. Well, what's this all about? He asked hoarsely. The doctor quickly checked his pulse and found it steady. No CPR needed. After a manual reset, the monitor returned to normal. False alarm. Later at the nurse's station, we marveled at the bizarre malfunction. But I knew better after hearing similar stories. Room 309's spiritual tenant wanted to test our response time. We passed this supernatural drill with flying colors. My heart still racing from the adrenaline rush, I said a little prayer of thanks that our patient was unharmed. As long as I'm working here, our ghostly resident can set off all the false monitor alarms they want. I'll always be ready for anything, paranormal or otherwise. The legend of Roswell and Area 51 have seeped into American culture like ink on a blotter, stories and theories evolving with each generation. So when I found myself driving through the Nevada desert, not far from that infamous military base, I couldn't help but think of all the UFO stories I had heard growing up. It was a late evening and the last traces of sunlight were fading from the sky. My destination was a small motel a few miles ahead, a convenient stopover before reaching Las Vegas. As I glanced at the rearview mirror, I noticed a faint glow in the sky, which I dismissed as a distant airplane, or perhaps a military aircraft from the nearby base. Suddenly, my car's electronics started to glitch. The radio turned to static, the GPS flickered, and the headlights dimmed. Before I could react, the car stalled, leaving me stranded on the deserted road. As if on cue, the glow in the sky grew brighter, and I watched in awe as a saucer-shaped object descended, hovering about 50 feet above the ground. It was nothing like the CGI effects from movies or the shaky footage in conspiracy theory documentaries. This was real, almost mundane in its physicality, yet overwhelmingly surreal. It hovered silently, its surface adorned with pulsating lights forming intricate patterns. I scrambled to find my phone to document this extraordinary event, but it was dead, despite being fully charged just moments earlier. The object hovered for what felt like an eternity, but must have been mere minutes, then ascended rapidly into the sky and disappeared, its glow shrinking to a mere speck before vanishing completely. As soon as the object was gone, my car sprang back to life as if nothing had happened. The headlights brightened, the radio resumed its broadcast and the GPS recalibrated itself. Dumbfounded, I continued to drive, my mind racing to comprehend what I had just witnessed. I finally arrived at the motel, my nerves on edge. The receptionist must have noticed my disheveled state but I dared not speak of what I had seen. I went to my room, finding solace in its four walls, yet my sleep was restless, punctuated by dreams of otherworldly landscapes and cryptic symbols. When I woke up the next day, I questioned whether it had been a dream or a hallucination brought on by fatigue. However, my phone was still dead, refusing to power on, as if carrying a silent testimony 
to the events of the previous night. Since then, I've scoured the internet for similar stories, finding some peace in accounts from credible witnesses who describe the same patterns of lights, electrical malfunctions, and profound senses of awe. Skeptics may call it a hoax, a misidentification, or a psychological phenomenon, but for those of us who have seen it, we know that it's something far more mysterious. Something that challenges our understanding of reality, forcing us to consider the unnerving possibility that we are not alone. And so I add my story to the UFO encounters, a narrative not of fear but of wonder, a glimpse into the cosmic web of stories that we're only just beginning to understand. My brother Amir and I were inseparable. Growing up, we shared secrets, dreams, and countless memories. But life has its cruel twists, and a car accident took Amir away from me two years ago. The grief was overwhelming, and I struggled to find a way to move on without him. One evening, as I was reminiscing about our childhood, my phone buzzed with a new message. The sender's name sent a chill down my spine. Amir. The message read, Find my diary, under the old oak. I stared at the screen, my heart racing. It had to be some sick joke, I thought. Someone must have gotten hold of Amir's old phone or number. I tried calling the number, but it went straight to voicemail. The next day, another message arrived. Please, it's important. Remember our treehouse? The mention of the treehouse struck a chord. Amir and I had built a tree house in the massive oak tree at the back of our childhood home. It was our secret hideout, a place where we shared our deepest thoughts and dreams. Driven by a mix of curiosity and hope, I decided to visit our old home. The property had been sold after our parents passed away, but the new owners were kind enough to let me explore the backyard when I explained the situation. The treehouse was still there, though weathered by time. Climbing up, memories flooded back. And there, hidden beneath a loose floorboard, I found a small, leather-bound diary. The diary was filled with Amir's handwriting, detailing his thoughts and experiences over the last few months of his life. As I flipped through the pages, one entry caught my attention. It spoke of a dream he had where he'd passed away but was able to communicate with me through messages. He wrote of his wish for me to find this diary, to understand his feelings, and to find closure. Tears streamed down my face as I read his words. It felt as though Amir was right there beside me, guiding me one last time. Over the next few days, I pored over the diary, reliving memories and gaining insight into Amir's world. It was a therapeutic experience, helping me come to terms with his loss and understanding the depth of our bond. The messages stopped after I found the diary. I never figured out how they were sent or who was behind them. But deep down, I wanted to believe it was Amir, reaching out from beyond to offer comfort and closure. I kept the diary, cherishing it as a final gift from my brother. It served as a reminder of our bond and the belief that love transcends even the barriers of life and death. I work as a night guard at Alcatraz Island the infamous former prison located in San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz has been many things, a military fortification, a military prison, and later a maximum security federal penitentiary. But for the last several decades, it has stood as a tourist attraction, a place where people can come and glimpse the darker aspects of human history. When you work the night shift at a place like Alcatraz, you encounter stories of hauntings, Whispers of Al Capone playing his banjo in the shower room, 
or cries of prisoners long gone still echoing in the cells. These stories didn't bother me much. I've never been the superstitious type, and years on the job made me familiar, almost comfortable with the island's grim ambiance. However, local folklore speaks of something else, a figure known as the Lone Wanderer. Unlike the hauntings that are confined to the cells and specific locations within the prison, this entity is said to wander around the island. The legend goes that he was a prisoner who loved the sea. During his sentence, he was a well-behaved inmate and earned the right to do some gardening as a daytime job. They say he was plotting an escape, intending to swim across the bay, but he was caught and thrown into solitary confinement where he passed away, never seeing the open ocean again. The lone wanderer, they say, still roams the island at night, searching for his lost chance at freedom. One evening, a thick fog rolled in over the Bay Area. The fog in San Francisco is different. It's thicker, almost palpable, like you could grab a handful if you tried. That night, I was doing my usual rounds, walking with my flashlight and radio. The tourists had long since departed, and it was just me and the echoes of my footsteps. I reached the gardens, the place where, according to legend, the lone wanderer used to work. I don't know if it was the fog or the solitude, but something felt off. The air was denser, and I had a peculiar feeling of being watched. That's when I heard it. Footsteps. Not my own, but another set, faint and inconsistent, as if hesitating. I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound, but it revealed nothing. Unease crawled up my spine, but I convinced myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued my rounds until I reached the edge of the island that faced the open sea, where the fog was now so thick I could barely see a few feet in front of me. And that's when I saw him. A figure, indistinct but unmistakably human, standing at the edge, looking out toward the ocean. For a moment, I froze. My radio, my flashlight, they all seemed irrelevant. The figure stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. And then, as quietly as he appeared, he walked away, dissipating into the fog. I stood there, my heart pounding, both terrified and fascinated. Was it the lone wanderer? I can't say for sure. What I do know is that I felt an unexplainable sense of sorrow, tinged with a freedom I've never felt before. A freedom that can only come when you're so close to achieving something you've yearned for, but are held back at the final moment. The next day I went through the security footage but found nothing. No signs of anyone walking the island. I've continued my nightly round since then, occasionally standing at the edge, looking out into the sea, contemplating the story of the Lone Wanderer. Even today when the fog rolls in and the atmosphere turns heavy, I can't help but feel a presence, an entity bound by longing and unfulfilled wishes. I haven't seen him again, but I often wonder, does he find solace in his eternal solitary walks, or is he forever haunted by the sea he can never touch? I'm not one to believe in ghost stories, but the night I spent at the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California, shifted my stance just a tad. You see, I'm a history grad student, and my research often involves studying architectural eccentricities and what they reveal about the zeitgeist of a particular era. Naturally, the Winchester House had been on my list. According to local folklore, Sarah Winchester, the widow of William Wirt Winchester, of the famous Rifle Manufacturing Company, built the house in a never-ending maze-like design to appease and confuse the spirits of those killed by Winchester rifles. 
Construction continued 24-7 until her death, resulting in a labyrinthine mansion with doors that led to nowhere, staircases that ended abruptly, and hallways that twisted in maddening directions. My advisor somehow managed to arrange for me to stay overnight in the mansion to immerse myself in the ambience for an upcoming paper. Armed with my notebook and a flashlight, I was led into the grand ballroom with its Tiffany glass windows and ornate wooden panels where I'd be spending the night. Around midnight, as I was jotting down observations about the intricate cornices and wainscoting, I heard it. Soft footsteps in the hallway. I initially brushed it off as the house settling. This place was old after all. But then I heard a door creak open, followed by a delicate murmur that seemed to be a soft tune, or perhaps a lament. My heart quickened. Was it a nocturnal tour? Maybe. Curiosity outweighing my apprehension, I left the ballroom and stepped into the hallway. I walked cautiously through the maze, each turn seemingly taking me further from my point of origin. It felt as if the house was absorbing me. Then I arrived at the seance room, where it said Sarah Winchester communicated with spirits for building instructions. The air inside felt thick and charged. I felt a subtle but definite pull towards the room. As I stepped inside, I saw the most extraordinary thing. Three wooden planchettes, commonly used in spirit boards, slowly moving on a table by themselves, forming what seemed like letters. My skepticism battled with the evidence before me, but before I could take a closer look, a cold gust of wind blew through the room, scattering the planchettes. I ran back to the ballroom, retracing my steps as best as I could, and locked myself in for the night. Come morning, I thanked the caretaker and left, my notebook teeming with more questions than answers. People say Sarah Winchester built a house to confuse spirits, but I can't help but wonder if she ended up capturing them instead, in its endless hallways and mysterious rooms. Whether the experience was a figment of my imagination, or a brush with the other side, it left me with a newfound respect for folklore. So here I am, back at my desk, piecing together the history of a house that defies all architectural logic, with an anecdote that defies all scientific reason. Will it make its way into my academic paper? Probably not. But it will certainly stay in my mind, as the night the Winchester Mystery House turned me, if only for a fleeting moment, into a believer. I had always considered myself a rational person, until I spent a semester studying in Coyoacan, Mexico City. A neighborhood steeped in history and culture, Coyoacan had been the stage for many significant events, including the lives of Diego Rivera and Frido Kahlo. Yet it wasn't the artistic heritage that captivated me. It was the local legend of Los Monmullos, the Whispering Walls, the tale goes like this. Many years ago, a powerful alchemist was rumored to have lived in a secluded mansion in Coyoacan. His name has been forgotten, but locals claim that his spirit still resides within the walls of a particular house near the Plaza Hidalgo. These walls, they say, whisper secrets and prophecies to those who dare listen. Intrigued by the myth, I decided to delve deeper. It didn't take long to identify the mansion in question, an imposing yet dilapidated structure that was currently serving as an antique store. The owner, Senora Martinez, was a kind elderly woman who had heard the whispers herself. But you must visit at dusk, she warned. That's when the walls are most talkative. Armed with curiosity, and a dash of skepticism, I returned to the mansion later that evening. 
The sun had just dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the cobblestone streets. As I entered the building, a sudden shiver ran down my spine. The atmosphere felt dense, almost as if it were charged with static electricity. Following Senora Martinez's instructions, I approached the oldest part of the mansion, a small chamber filled with dusty books and ancient artifacts. There, I stood silently, my ears straining to catch any sound. At first, there was nothing. Then, gradually, I began to hear a soft murmur. It was almost as if the walls themselves were whispering in hushed tones. I couldn't make out distinct words, but the timbre of the voices struck me. They carried an unexplainable weight, like a sorrowful lament or a prayer. Just then, a stronger voice broke through, clear and resonant. Ayuda, it said. Help. My heart pounded as I looked around, but the room was empty. It was unmistakably the wall that had spoken. In the following days, I couldn't shake the encounter from my mind. Consumed by the need to understand, I began researching more about the alchemist and the history of the mansion. To my surprise, I stumbled upon old documents, revealing that the alchemist had been a benevolent man, providing remedies to the sick during a plague that had swept through Cuyoacan. He had died under mysterious circumstances, and many believed that he had been betrayed by a close friend. Emboldened by this knowledge, I returned to the mansion. This time, the whispers seemed to acknowledge my presence, their murmurs turning into what sounded like a soft, appreciative sigh. As I left, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace, as if a weight had been lifted from the room. That encounter forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that some mysteries are beyond rational explanation. The whispering walls of Coyoacan became a long-lasting mystery to me, a whispered legend that I was fortunate enough to hear, adding another layer to the rich background of local folklore. And so, every time I pass by that ancient mansion, I offer a nod of respect. After all, who am I to argue with the walls that speak, in a city where the boundary between legend and reality often blurs, leaving only awe in its wake? Oasis Medical Center wasn't a place anyone would mistake for a retreat, despite its name. It was an old, rundown hospital built in the 60s, with updates so infrequent it was like stepping back in time. But a paycheck is a paycheck, and you take work where you can find it. I was an IT specialist by day, a position that often had me walking the endless maze of hallways to fix computers and other electronic equipment. The medical staff appreciated me, and I didn't mind the work, until I started noticing the faces. The first time it happened, I was installing a software update on one of the heart rate monitors in room 417. Leaning over, I glanced at the screen, waiting for the loading bar to fill. And there, reflected in the glass, was a face. Not my face, mind you, but a face I didn't recognize. Old, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks. A man, or what used to be one. I spun around. The room was empty, except for the patient, an elderly woman asleep in her bed. The hairs on my arms stood up. But I told myself it was just stress, lack of sleep, whatever. I shook it off and finished the update. The next time, I was in the surgical ward, calibrating a piece of equipment I couldn't even pronounce. I bent down to adjust a dial when I saw another face in the reflective surface of the metal tray next to me. A young girl this time, with eyes too big for her face, staring at me like I had done something wrong. I jerked back, my heart pounding against my ribs. 
A nurse walked by, glancing curiously at me. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I muttered, doubting the words even as I said them. This started happening more frequently. Faces in computer monitors, faces in the glass panels of medicine cabinets, faces in the reflective surfaces of surgical tools. Always when I was alone, always when I least expected it. And always different. Men, women, young, old, eyes full of sadness, anger, or accusation. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started digging through old hospital records, scouring news articles online, anything to give me some insight. What I found sent a chill down my spine. Over the years, Oasis Medical Center had an unusually high number of unexplained deaths. Patients who passed away under mysterious circumstances, with causes of death listed as inconclusive. Were these the faces I was seeing? Spirits trapped in the hospital, bound to the place where they had met their untimely end? I took my findings to management, but they dismissed me, saying that it was all hearsay and coincidences. They even hinted that if I kept it up, I would be let go. So I shut up, but I didn't stop looking. I was transferred to the night shift. Less staff, fewer questions. I spent my nights walking the dark halls, my ears straining for sounds, my eyes narrowed in concentration. I took to carrying a small pocket mirror, taking it out to glimpse reflections when I felt I was being watched. And that's when I saw her, the young girl, the one I'd seen in the surgical ward, reflected in my pocket mirror. She looked at me and pointed behind me. I turned around and there, on the computer monitor, was a series of numbers. Medical records, a date, I didn't know. I documented everything, started putting pieces together, dates matching records and news articles. It was like a grim puzzle, each face corresponding to an unexplained death, each one a silent scream, a plea for justice. But what could I do? I was no detective, no avenger of spirits. Even now, as I sit in my makeshift office, surrounded by equipment that should be devoid of anything supernatural, I know I'm not alone. The faces are still there, glimpses in the glass, flickers on the screen. Are they asking me for my help or warning me? I don't know. All I know is that I can't escape them. Even as I write this, a reflection not my own stares back at me from the monitor's glass. It watches me, studies me, and for a brief moment, I swear it smiles. So I'm left with a choice. Dig deeper, risk my job, my sanity, to give these lost souls a voice? Or turn away, leave the hospital, and hope that the faces in the glass are bound to this place and not me. Each night, as I clock in and walk the dim corridors, I can't shake the feeling that my decision is no longer just about me. And in every reflection, I see eyes, watching, waiting, wondering what I'm going to do next. In the heart of the Brazilian Amazon, the rainforest is a living entity, its voice woven from the polyphonic chorus of flora and fauna. Explorers speak of it in reverent tones, and locals treat it with a mix of respect and sacredness. As a sound ethnographer, I've collected sonic landscapes from around the world, but nothing prepared me for the mystery I'd encountered deep in the Brazilian rainforest, a lullaby that didn't belong to any human tongue yet carried the weight of ancient lullabies hummed by mothers across millennia. The rumor was prevalent among the native communities. They spoke of O Canto de la Floresta, the song of the forest, a lullaby that the forest sings to itself when night lays its dark veil over the Amazon. Intrigued and armed with cutting-edge recording equipment, 
I ventured into the dense labyrinth of trees and waterways, led by Rodrigo. A local guide whose knowledge of the forest was intuitive, gained from a lifetime of coexistence. As darkness enveloped the forest, a profound stillness settled in, a pause in the continuous murmur that characterized the daytime hours. Rodrigo signaled for us to stop and listen. The air grew thick with anticipation, each moment stretching, as if time itself was holding its breath. And then it began. A melody emerged from the depths of the forest, delicate and haunting. It floated on the night air, ethereal yet distinct, a sequence of notes that resembled a lullaby, cradling everything it touched in a gentle embrace. Though no human lips were shaping these sounds, the tune reverberated with an emotional timber that struck a universal chord. My fingers trembled slightly as I set up the recording equipment, but when I pressed the record button, the melody suddenly faltered, its notes scattering like startled birds. A wave of chills cascaded down my spine. The forest had sensed the intrusion. Its song was not for capturing. It was a gift for those willing to listen, to be present. We should not try to cage what is free, Rodrigo whispered, his words imbued with a wisdom that transcended the moment. As we trekked back, the forest resumed its nocturnal serenade, the notes lingering behind us like a gossamer trail. Though I returned with empty audio files, the resonance of that night stayed with me, humming softly in the corners of my memory. Back in my world of decibels and frequencies, where every sound is dissected and analyzed, the Amazon's mysterious lullaby defies categorization. It has seeped into my own understanding of sound, of its primal power to communicate beyond words or definitions. Now, when people ask about the most extraordinary sound I've ever heard, I think of the Amazon's lullaby, its invisible notes woven into the very fabric of the rainforest. While the experience eludes quantification, it thrives in the realm of the inexplicable. And isn't it precisely these enigmas, these whispers from beyond the veil of comprehension, that make our world infinitely richer, a symphony of unspoken connections. Fifteen years ago, I went camping with two school friends in bushland that backed onto my dad's property in Australia. My dad didn't spend much time at the house, but said that we could use it as a base to dump any gear we might not need. He also gave me a heads up that he might creep up onto our campsite that night and scare the guys I was with. We hiked from the house for about four hours through very dense bush where we found a clearing and decided to set up our camp. Looking around the place for firewood, we kept turning up a lot of old bones, some so old they almost looked like wood. We concluded that due to the land once being used for farming, it was likely that they were cow bones. We came up for a few more theories for the sake of scaring each other and then built our fire even burning a couple of the wood-like bones just to see what would happen, and we settled in. I was woken up by one of my buddies at about one o'clock in the morning, who said he swears he saw a torchlight on the tent wall. Excellent, I thought. We sat in silence for a few minutes before the light came back. This was great. I really hammed it up making up stories about murders in the area and escaped prisoners, fully believing this was my dad. The light from the torch fixed on our tent and then switched off. We could hear leaves and sticks moving around outside and my buddies were on the verge of tears. Then we started hearing whispering outside as well as some low mumbling. Dad had brought some friends in on the prank, dedicated. The torchlight came back on and pressed right up to the tent wall, and a hand began tapping across the top while the whispering continued. 
My dad had brought some friends in on the prank and convinced them to walk four hours through dense scrub in the middle of the night just to shine a torch on our tent. At that point, I started to panic. Then it just stopped completely. Footsteps didn't recede, nothing like that. It just stopped. It stopped about an hour after it began, so we sat there for quite a while scared. Afterwards, we sat in total silence, aside from the sobbing of my buddies, and at dawn, we packed up and got the heck out of there. We got back to the house and dad was there. He apologized and said he had planned to come out and see us last night, but fell asleep at his girlfriend's house. We told him about what happened and he was genuinely dumbfounded. Interestingly, I went back to the spot a couple of years ago after telling this story to a friend. We found a small shack made of corrugated iron pockmarked with bullet holes, a 44 gallon drum full of burned clothes, a pile of firewood, and two axes. Who knows if it's related, but it was definitely creepy. As an ICU nurse, I've witnessed many patients pass, but Tony's death stunned me in a way that I still can't explain. He was a beloved grandfather in his late 60s, on life support after a major stroke. His chances were slim, but the family held out hope. Late one night during my shift, Tony's monitors suddenly started alarms. He had gone into cardiac arrest. We immediately started CPR, but the chaotic noise faded into the background as I tried to focus. The doctor began asking Tony questions, trying to stimulate any remaining brain activity. Tony, can you hear me? If you can hear me, try to respond. To my shock, a weak voice croaked, Yes, doc, I'm still here. The doctor and I froze and looked at each other with wide eyes. The voice was clearly Tony's, but it was impossible. He had flatlined. Tony, are you in any pain? The doctor continued warily. Again, Tony's strained voice uttered, No, all the pain's gone now. My hands shook as I continued chest compressions. How was he speaking with no heart rhythm? Do you see anything around you, Tony? Any bright lights? asked the doctor. No lights, just peaceful darkness, Tony responded. His voice grew fainter with each word. It's all right, Doc. My time's done. And please tell my family I love them. Then silence. Ten minutes later, we finally ceased efforts and called his time of death. But the chill from hearing a dead man's voice never left me. I avoided mentioning the supernatural event in my report. Who would believe a patient conversed while flatlined? I questioned my own sanity, but deep down I know what I heard. Since that night, I've paid closer attention as patients slip away. A few times, I'm certain that I've made out faint whispers of loved ones' names or gasped prayers long after the vitals ceased, their voices like wisps of vapor untethered from their bodies. Somehow, in those final moments between life and whatever lies beyond, there's an uncanny communication that technology can't detect. The monitor may show a flatline, but the spirit still stirs. Perhaps we put too much faith in our tools, and not enough in forces unseen. There's so much about the human spirit that eludes even our most advanced science. All I know is that day, Tony spoke to us beyond the veil of life through a means unknown. His fading words will forever resonate. Wherever his spirit traveled next, I hope he found the peace he sought. For now, I keep monitoring the screen, but listening beyond it as well, honoring the mysterious ways the dying may speak their last pieces 
even after the ship of life has sailed. Some ports of call lie beyond the reach of our maps. We can only have faith in the journey. I stared at my reflection. Sweat gathered on my brow. The reflection was grinning, fang-like teeth showing, but my own lips were pressed tight, a flat line of apprehension. It's just a mirror, just a glass and a bit of silver paint, I told myself, but I couldn't shake off the chill snaking up my spine. Glancing away, I tried to focus on the small, unimportant details around me, the chipped paint on the bathroom door, the slowly dripping faucet, anything to get that sinister smile out of my head. Yet I felt its eyes, my eyes, still locked onto me. The room seemed to close in, walls breathing like they had lungs, squeezing the air out. I forced myself to look again. The grin was wider, and my reflection's eyes squinted as if it were laughing at some secret joke. I needed to break the loop, and so I raised a trembling hand, expecting my reflection to mimic me. It didn't. That was it. I hurled my fist at the glass. The mirror shattered, pieces of my distorted image scattering onto the tile floor. For a moment, there was just silence, just my own labored breathing. Relief washed over me. Then I heard it, a whispering giggle echoing from the shards littering the ground. My eyes darted to each broken piece, and I saw that my reflection still wore the same haunting smile. Every single piece grinned back at me. I bolted out of the bathroom, tripping over the edge of a rug as I entered the hallway. My bare feet pounded on the hardwood floor as I sped toward the living room, heart racing like a drum roll. The house felt alien, each creak of wood and distant rustle of leaves outside taking on a menacing tone. I grabbed my phone from the coffee table. No way I was staying another second here. I dialed Connor's number, my closest neighbor, and a friend who lived down the road. But the voice that answered wasn't his. Having fun yet? It was my voice, tinged with that same mischievous tone. I threw the phone across the room, it smacked against the wall and dropped onto the couch. Enough was enough. I headed for the front door, grabbing my coat in a swift motion. The door creaked open, and I stepped into the night. My feet had barely touched the gravel of the driveway when I froze. Every window in my house glowed with an unnatural light, and in each one I could see my reflection, grinning, laughing, watching me. I turned my back to it all, refusing to give those warped images another second of my attention. I walked down the empty road, moonlight casting long shadows on the pavement. In the distance, I heard a wolf howl, a lonely sound swallowed by the sprawling woods flanking either side of the road. When I finally reached Connor's house, I didn't bother knocking. I let myself in, locking the door behind me. He found me there, sitting on his living room floor, shaking. I told him everything. He listened, his face a canvas of concern and disbelief. Then he went silent, his eyes widening. He pointed behind me, his finger trembling. Jake, is that your coat hanging on the door? I turned. It was. My coat, the one I had grabbed on my way out. Except, I was wearing my coat, wasn't I? A cold wave of realization swept over me. Don't turn around, Connor said, his voice barely a whisper. But I did. I did turn. And there I was, grinning from the doorway, wearing the same coat, and fading into the dark hall behind me, as if pulled by unseen strings.
I had heard the stories about Il Dipinto Maledetto, the cursed painting, long before I decided to visit Sforza Castle in Milan. I was a freelance art historian with a penchant for the eerie and the strange. The castle, an imposing structure built in the 15th century, was the perfect blend of history and mystery. After maneuvering through the cobblestone streets of Milan, I finally found myself at the castle's grand entrance. Inside, the courtyards and towers sprawled in a labyrinthine layout, and the walls seemed to reverberate with the whispers of bygone eras. I had specifically come to see the art collections, especially the works of the Italian Renaissance. As I made my way through the castle's museums, an elderly guide named Signora Bianchi noticed my intense focus on the paintings. She approached and began a conversation. Ah, a connoisseur, she said, smiling. Would you like to see something unique? I was intrigued. Of course. Follow me, she said, leading me down a lesser known corridor. There is one painting that we rarely show to the public, for it has a strange tale attached to it. She paused in front of an unassuming wooden door. Unlocking it, she guided me into a dimly lit room where a single painting hung on the wall, veiled by a curtain. She drew the curtain aside. Behold, Il Dipinto Maladetto. The painting was hauntingly beautiful, depicting a young woman with melancholic eyes. Her gaze seemed to follow you, lending her an eerily lifelike quality. Signora Bianchi proceeded to tell me the local legend. The painting was created by an obscure artist who was infatuated with the woman depicted. However, she did not reciprocate his feelings and tragically passed away under mysterious circumstances. Brokenhearted and distraught, the artist is said to have imbued the painting with his soul, cursing it forever. It's believed the painting brings misfortune to anyone who stares into the eyes of the woman for too long, she warned. I chuckled, half amused and half skeptical. An intriguing story, to be sure. Ah, the skepticism of youth, she sighed. But beware, many have felt a strange melancholy after looking into her eyes, and some have even claimed to see the figure in their dreams. As I turned back to the painting, our eyes locked. For a fleeting moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow, as if her emotions were flowing into me. Shaking off the sensation, I thanked Signora Bianchi and left the room, attributing my feelings to the power of suggestion. That night, however, I was plagued by vivid dreams of the woman in the painting. She seemed to beckon me, her eyes filled with an unspeakable sadness. The next morning, I couldn't shake off the eerie experience. Whether it was the product of an overactive imagination or something more inexplicable, the cursed painting had etched its story onto my consciousness. I returned to the museum, not to debunk the tale, but to pay my respects to the artistry that could evoke such powerful emotions. As I stood before Il Dipinto Maledetto one final time, I felt humbled by the realization that some stories, whether folklore or fact, are destined to remain a mystery. And in that gray area between skepticism and belief, I found an uncanny form of beauty that defied simple explanations. Sforza Castle continued to be a symbol of Milan's rich history, but for me it became a place where art and legend coalesced into a compelling, haunting narrative, one that I would carry with me long after I left the castle's ancient walls. I took a job as a part-time night concierge at the Awani Hotel in Yosemite National Park, not expecting much beyond the mundane tasks of checking guests in and out or giving directions to tourists who'd lost their way. Having spent most of my childhood in California, I was well acquainted with the rumors about the indigenous Miwok tribes and their legends. 
but I never took them seriously until one night at the hotel. The Awani, designed with both Native American and Art Deco influences, is said to have borrowed its name from the Miwok tribes who once lived in the Yosemite Valley. Awani means the place of a gaping mouth, and if that doesn't spell uncanny, I don't know what does. My older colleagues often said that the name wasn't just a poetic description of the valley, but had a more ominous undertone. On the night in question, I was at the front desk, flicking through a trashy mystery novel I'd picked up to pass the time. The clock struck midnight, and the hotel was silent except for the occasional creak of its old wooden floors settling. I glanced at the large stained glass panels depicting the Miwok legends, which seemed to shimmer in the moonlight. I'd always found them charming, but tonight they looked different, almost alive. Suddenly, the light above the front desk flickered, and the hotel's old-fashioned landline rang. Startled, I picked it up. Awani Hotel, how may I assist you? Static buzzed on the other end, but through it, I heard what sounded like chanting, soft and ethereal. I listened closer, and realized that the chant resembled the Miwok language. I couldn't make out the words, but the tune sounded like a traditional prayer. Who is this? I asked. The line went dead. Unsettled, I recalled one of the Miwok myths. The story of Usumate, a spirit said to wander the valley, singing songs to bless the land, but also to ward off intruders. The legend never particularly interested me until now. A series of coincidences, I told myself, trying to shake off the discomfort. Just then, the lights flickered again, but this time I saw a shadow move across one of the large dining halls visible from the reception. I considered staying put, but my sense of duty got the better of me. I walked cautiously toward the hall. As I entered, I saw an ephemeral figure near a grand piano its form resembling a Miwok shaman, draped in ceremonial robes. It looked up, seemingly making eye contact, before vanishing into thin air. I returned to my desk, my heart pounding. My logical mind sought rational explanations, but I couldn't find any. Was it Osumate? Was I the intruder he sought to ward off? Or was he, in some inexplicable way, blessing the place he considered sacred? The experience transformed the way I saw the Awani and the valley it stood in. These legends, I realized, weren't just stories, but the spiritual imprints of those who'd walked this land long before us. Though I never experienced anything of that sort again during my time at the Awani, I found myself paying silent respects to Usumate whenever I passed the stained glass panels depicting the Miwok myths. Rational or not, it felt like the right thing to do. As an ER nurse, I've seen my fair share of strange things during the graveyard shift, but nothing prepared me for the night that I saw the ghost of a young child wandering the halls of our pediatric ward. It started like any other night, busy and chaotic. We had a bad car accident come in, so all hands were on deck in the ER. Once things finally calmed down around 3 a.m., I decided to stretch my legs and grab a coffee upstairs. That's when I saw him. A young boy, no more than six or seven, peeking his head around the corner at the end of the long hall. He had this lost, forlorn look on his face that struck me as odd. Quietly, I called out, Hey there, are you lost? But he didn't respond. He only stared back with sad eyes before disappearing around the corner. I hurried after him, turning the corner only to find the hallway completely empty. A chill went down my spine. There's no way he could have gotten out of there that fast. I searched every room, 
every nook and cranny of that ward looking for the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. When I told the other nurses what I had seen, they just nodded. It turns out several of them had seen this ghostly boy over the years, always wandering the halls late at night. We now think he's the spirit of a child who passed away here long ago, still drawn to the pediatric ward where he spent his final days. Though the encounter spooked me at first, I now find it kind of comforting to think that he finds some solace in visiting the kids, like he's watching over them, even from beyond. So, if you ever find yourself in the pediatric ward late at night and see a lone boy wandering the halls, don't be afraid. Just know that he's one of our own, and he means no harm. In the vast wilderness of Maine, home to ancient forests and sprawling lakes, there exists a legend that has fascinated adventurers and locals alike for generations. The legend of Pomola. Said to be a creature with the body of a man, the head of a moose, and the wings and talons of an eagle, Pomola is believed to reside near Mount Katahdin, the highest peak in the state. Tales of encounters with this mythic being have been whispered around campfires, leaving an impression on the collective psyche of the region. Driven by a mix of skepticism and insatiable curiosity, I decided to embark on a journey to investigate this elusive figure. Equipped with a backpack containing essential gear, thermal camera, voice recorder, and basic survival tools, I set forth toward Mount Katahdin, a formidable entity rising against the backdrop of Maine's wilderness. As I trekked through the dense forest, my boots sinking slightly into the mossy ground, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the landscape around me. The trees seemed like ancient guardians, and the wind whispered secrets only they were privy to. It was as if the entire forest was holding its breath, anticipating something profound. I finally reached a vantage point near the base of Mount Katahdin as the sun dipped below the horizon. The fading light cast long shadows that danced in the chill of the approaching night. I set up my thermal camera and initiated the voice recorder. If you're out there, Pomola, I mean no harm. I simply wish to understand. I spoke softly into the recorder, the words almost freezing in the icy air. For what felt like an eternity, there was silence, save for the distant rustle of leaves and the occasional howl of a far-off wolf. Then, out of nowhere, a cacophonous roar shattered the tranquility. My thermal camera picked up a rapid fluctuation in temperature, registering a form that was neither wholly animal nor completely human. For a brief second, my eyes met what I can only describe as a visage melding moose and man, framed by expansive feathered wings. Just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure vanished into the looming darkness of the mountain, leaving behind an unnerving silence and a sense of awe that gripped my very core. I collected my equipment and retreated my footsteps quickening with each yard, a newfound respect for the legend filling my thoughts. In the days that followed, I examined the data and recordings which offered no conclusive evidence, no photographs, no groundbreaking EVPs. Yet the experience itself became a different form of evidence, a haunting reminder that legends often contain kernels of truth folded into the fabric of the places they inhabit. I have yet to return to Mount Katahdin, but the legend of Pomola remains etched in my memory, a spectral presence that defies explanation yet demands reverence. Whether it's a guardian spirit of the mountain, a cryptid, or a mere figment of collective folklore, I cannot say. But what is clear is that in the shadowed corners of Maine's wilderness, Mystery and wonder are alive, 
compelling us to question the boundaries of our understanding and to respect the ancient stories that ripple through the land. I was sitting on the balcony, a cup of coffee in hand, watching the sun sink behind the city skyline. The buildings cast long shadows, their outlines turning to silhouettes against the fading light. It was a moment of stillness, one I had learned to treasure in a life otherwise filled with noise and haste. That's when it happened. Without warning, the sky began to deform. Towers bent at impossible angles, and skyscrapers folded over like they were made of paper. The city compressed in on itself, the whole panorama turning into a surreal, collapsing accordion. My coffee cup slipped from my hand, crashing onto the floor, but I hardly noticed. I was too fixated on the impossible sight before me. It was as if reality itself was being manipulated, the natural laws governing time and space summarily dismissed. Buildings that should have been miles apart were suddenly adjacent, then overlapping, then melding into a singular twisted mass. Roads, bridges, entire neighborhoods swallowed up, leaving behind an unrecognizable jumble of architecture and negative space. My heart raced, my mind struggling to process what my eyes were seeing. I gripped the railing, knuckles white, half expecting the balcony to fold into the nightmare landscape. But then, as quickly as it had started, the city snapped back to its original form. Skyscrapers untangled themselves, roads stretched back to their proper lengths, and everything returned to its normal state, as if nothing had happened. Except it had. I had seen it. The twisted shapes, the melding of structures, the complete disregard for the laws of physics. They were imprinted on my memory, a scar on my understanding of the world. I retreated inside, locking the sliding door behind me. My eyes darted around the room, half expecting the walls to start folding, but nothing happened. Everything was as it should be, or at least appeared to be. I grabbed my phone, texting friends, posting on social media, desperate to find someone else who had seen what I had. But no one responded with anything other than confusion or concern for my well-being. Days passed. I found myself unable to step back onto the balcony, fearful of what I might witness. I buried myself in work, in social commitments, in anything that could distract me from that unexplainable moment. But the city had other plans. It started with little things. Street signs displaying gibberish. Buildings appearing shorter or taller than they should be. The city map occasionally glitching out on my phone. Each occurrence was brief, easy to dismiss as a fluke or a trick of the light. Yet they kept happening, each anomaly chipping away at my sense of reality, reminding me that something was fundamentally wrong. And so I find myself here, writing this down both as a record and a warning. I don't know what caused the city to fold or why I was the only one to witness it. I don't know if it was a glitch in the fabric of reality or something more sinister. But I do know this. The skyline is not what it seems. It's a facade, a mask hiding something we're not meant to see. And now that I've glimpsed what's behind it, I can't shake the feeling that it's only a matter of time before the mask falls away completely. What happens then, I don't know. But as I sit here, staring out at the city that was once my home, I can't escape the terrifying thought that one day the skyline will fold again, and this time it won't unfold. So I watch and wait, my eyes never straying too far from those towering silhouettes, wondering when they'll make their next move and what that move will mean for all of us who live in the shadow of their hidden instability. Until then, the skyline remains, a distorted reflection of a reality I no longer trust, but have no choice but to inhabit.
Life in my Michigan cabin had always been a tranquil experience, a deliberate withdrawal from the chaos of modern existence. Nestled deep in the woods, it was a place where time seemed to pause, where the relentless chatter of society was replaced by the hum of the wind and the chattering of woodland creatures. But that serenity would eventually give way to a series of disturbing events, events that would chip away at my skepticism and introduce me to a very real local legend, the Dogman. It all began on a crisp autumn evening. The leaves had turned a myriad of oranges and reds, and the air carried a fresh, earthy scent. I was chopping wood near my shed when I heard it, a low growl, different from the usual sounds that the forest animals made. It was guttural and strangely menacing. I paused, axe in hand, scanning the tree line for the source. But there was nothing, just the fading light casting long, haunting shadows. Over the next few weeks, odd occurrences started to disrupt the quietude of my life. I would wake up to find things outside my cabin moved or knocked over, my firewood scattered, my trash cans toppled, and most unsettlingly, claw marks on the trees surrounding my property. These were no ordinary marks. They were far too large and deliberate, not like anything that a deer or even a bear would make. The tension escalated one night when the growling returned. It was louder this time, closer, accompanied by heavy footsteps that circled my cabin. I sat in the darkness, clutching a hunting rifle, peering nervously through my curtains at the ominous void beyond the glass. Then I saw the eyes, two yellow orbs glowing in the dark staring directly at me. My heart pounded in my chest as a figure emerged from the shadows, tall and bipedal, covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was a nightmarish blend of man and wolf, and in that chilling moment, I knew I was face to face with the dog man. Our eyes locked and the creature let out a haunting howl that echoed through the forest, filling the air with a palpable sense of dread. I raised my rifle, my hands shaking, but the creature seemed to sense my intention and vanished into the woods, its growl fading into the distance, but its presence lingering like an unspoken threat. Days turned into weeks and the incidents around my cabin continued, yet I couldn't bring myself to leave. This was my home and I would not be driven out by fear. But I took precautions, installing heavy-duty locks and reinforcing my windows, always keeping my rifle within arm's reach. Then came the night that would forever alter my understanding of the world. A powerful storm was rolling in, the wind howling like a chorus of anguished souls, the trees swaying violently in the tempest. It was the perfect backdrop for the dogman's return. And return it did. The creature appeared at my window, its eyes glowing even brighter against the stormy darkness, its snarl sending a chill down my spine. But this time I was ready. I grabbed my rifle, aimed at those menacing eyes, and fired. The bullet shattered the window and hit its mark, but the creature let out a howl, not of pain, but of anger, of indignation. It backed away, its eyes locked onto mine for one last moment before disappearing into the tempest, leaving me with a shattered window and a shattered worldview. I spent the rest of that stormy night in a state of heightened alert, rifle in hand, grappling with the surreal reality of my situation. I had faced the dogman, a creature of local legend and frightening reality, and had come away with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lurk in the Michigan woods. The experiences around my cabin have since quieted down, but the sense of unease remains. I've shared my story with a few close friends who have met it with a mixture of skepticism and intrigued concern. And while I don't know if the dog man will ever return, I continue to live here in my secluded Michigan cabin forever aware that some legends are grounded in truths too unsettling to dismiss, lurking in the shadows of both our world and our imagination.
Eastbrook, a quaint town tucked away in Maine, has always intrigued me with its rich lore and the tales of the enigmatic Eastbrook Harpy. According to local folklore, this cryptid is a blend of woman and bird, with the ability to emit a wail that freezes even the bravest hearts. I decided to venture into the Maine woods, armed with a camera, a voice recorder, and a compass, determined to unravel the truth behind the harpy myth. The woods exuded a mystical atmosphere. Old growth trees loomed high above their branches, woven into intricate patterns that seemed to obscure the sky. The forest floor was a quiet orchestra of rustling leaves and hidden life. Despite the picturesque setting, a sense of foreboding seeped through, as though the forest itself was warning me of what lay ahead. It wasn't long before I reached a clearing, believed by locals to be a hot spot for harpy sightings. With bated breath and beating heart, I set up my makeshift base, placing the voice recorder in the middle of the clearing and setting the camera to capture any movement. Is anyone here? I asked into the void, my voice somehow managing to pierce the heavy silence. Nothing. Just the whispering wind and the distant hoot of an owl. If you're the Eastbrook Carpy, can you give me a sign? And then it happened. A scream unlike any I had ever heard ripped through the forest air. A melding of human agony and avian screech. My camera trembled in my hands as I aimed it toward the source of the sound. For a brief moment, I saw it. A figure, half woman, half bird, perched atop a tree. Its eyes glowed a fierce yellow, and a spread of feathers framed its form. The entity took flight, disappearing into the canopy of trees, but not before it left me with a sense of existential dread, a reminder of my fragility in a world filled with unknowns. I collected my equipment, my hands shaking, and made my way out of the woods, each step weighed down by the energy of what I had just experienced. As I reviewed the footage days later, I found that the camera had malfunctioned at the critical moment, turning my tangible evidence into nothing more than a personal anecdote tinged with the supernatural. I've never returned to those woods, but the experience lingers like a haunting melody, a brush with an entity or a legend that refused to be captured, but left its mark nonetheless. Whether the Eastbrook Carpy is real or just a figment of collective imagination, I can't say. What I do know is that some mysteries are woven so deeply into the fabric of a place that they become inseparable from it, part of the pulse that makes each leaf quiver and every shadow dance. And sometimes those mysteries find a way to reveal themselves, if only for a fleeting moment in ways that leave us questioning the boundaries of what we consider to be real. It was during one of my weekend visits to the local flea market that I stumbled upon the ring. Tucked away amidst a pile of old jewelry, its intricate design and shimmering stone caught my eye. The seller, an elderly woman with a kind face, told me it was from the early 1900s and once belonged to a woman named Lila. On a whim, I bought the ring and slipped it onto my finger. Almost immediately, a rush of images flooded my mind. I was standing in a grand ballroom the sound of classical music playing in the background. Men and women danced gracefully, their outfits reminiscent of the early 20th century. I could feel the weight of a long flowing gown and the tightness of a corset. The emotions were overwhelming, a mix of excitement, nervousness, and anticipation. As quickly as the vision came, it faded, and I was back at the flea market, disoriented and shaken. 
I took off the ring, trying to process what had just happened. Over the next few days, curiosity got the better of me. Each time I wore the ring, I was transported into Lila's world. I saw snippets of her life, her joys, her sorrows, her dreams, and her fears. I witnessed her secret romance with a man named Samuel, the heartbreak when they were forced apart due to societal expectations, and the joy when they reunited against all odds. Through these visions, I felt a deep connection to Lila. I began to research her life, hoping to learn more about this mysterious woman whose memories I was experiencing. I discovered that Lila was a prominent figure in the early 1900s, known for her advocacy for women's rights and her defiance against societal norms. But it was her personal diary, which I found in a local archive, that provided the most insight. Lila wrote of the ring, a gift from Samuel, and how it held a piece of her soul. She believed that whoever wore the ring would be able to see the world through her eyes and understand her struggles and triumphs. As the days turned into weeks, the line between Lila's world and mine began to blur. I found myself drawn to places she had been, meeting descendants of people she had known, and even advocating for causes she had believed in. One day, while wearing the ring, I had a vision of Lila in her final moments. She was old, but content, surrounded by loved ones. She spoke directly to me, thanking me for keeping her memories alive and urging me to live my life with the same passion and determination she had. With tears in my eyes, I promised her I would. The vision faded, and I was back in my world, the weight of the ring heavy on my finger. I continued to wear the ring, drawing strength and inspiration from Lila's memories. It became a symbol of our intertwined destinies, a testament to the power of the past to shape the present. And while I never had another vision as vivid as that final one, I always felt Lila's presence guiding me, reminding me of the legacy she left behind and the responsibility I had to honor it. I work as an archivist in the San Juan Capistrano Public Library. The library, aside from its usual fare of books and multimedia, has a small but significant collection of historical documents, old photographs, and newspapers, most of them related to the famous Mission San Juan Capistrano. The mission is known for many things, most popularly for the return of the swallows every year, but it also has darker legends. Among them is the haunting of a woman named La Llorona. La Llorona is the weeping woman, a legend that transcends all boundaries. While its origins are in Mexican folklore, the story has found resonance in California as well. The version that circulates here tells of a woman who is betrayed by her love and, in a fit of despair, drowned her children in the Mission's Creek. Realizing what she'd done, she wailed loudly, a cry so devastating that it's said to still reverberate on moonlit nights around the mission grounds. Now, I've always been skeptical of legends and myths. To me, they were cautionary tales to keep children obedient, or stories to add flavor to a town's history. That was until one winter evening, when I stumbled upon something uncanny. I was working late, sorting through a recent donation of old newspapers and photographs. A particular photograph caught my eye. It was a grainy black and white picture of a group of people standing in front of the mission. I couldn't place the date, but their clothing looked like they were from the early 1900s. What intrigued me was the faint outline of a woman standing apart from the group, her eyes hollow and her expression one of despair. Curious, I decided to scan the image to examine it more closely, but when the scan came through, the mysterious woman was missing from the image. I cleaned the scanner, 
thinking it was a malfunction, but she remained absent in every subsequent scan. Puzzled, I decided to lock up for the night. I left the library and began my short walk past the mission on my way home. The mission's bells hung silently in the Campanario, and a bright moon hung overhead. I felt the air around me grow colder, and a soft cry echoed on the wind, a wailing that seemed to seep from the very walls of the mission. Chilled, I picked up my pace. As I crossed the bridge over the creek, where La Llorona was said to have committed her terrible act, I heard a splash. I turned around, and in the moonlight I saw a figure standing in the water, a woman, her eyes hollow, and her face filled with an eternal sorrow. Our eyes met for just a moment, and a shiver ran down my spine. Then she vanished, and the crying ceased. I ran home, my skepticism shattered. The next day I found the photograph missing from the collection, as if it had never existed. Since that night, I've not heard the wailing again, but I've also never doubted the legend of La Llorona. So, if you ever find yourself near the mission on a moonlit night and hear a soft cry on the wind, remember the tale of the weeping woman and know that some legends are grounded in a reality we may never fully understand. In the land of the Great Lakes, where the woods stretch as far as the eye can see, tales of the Michigan Dogman have echoed across campfires and small-town diners for generations. I'd always been one for the outdoors, drawn to the untamed wilderness that Michigan so abundantly offers. Yet I was a skeptic at heart, taking the stories of the Dogman as fanciful local folklore until I stepped into those woods myself. The day started like any other camping trip. My backpack was filled with essentials, my hiking boots well-worn but reliable, and my mind eager for the solitude that only nature could offer. My chosen destination was a remote stretch of woodland near the Manistee River, far from the distractions of civilization. Arriving in the afternoon, I found the perfect spot to set up camp, where the trees opened up to reveal the sky, but still provided enough cover to make me feel enveloped by the wilderness. After pitching my tent and unpacking, I decided to explore the surrounding area, the chorus of chirping birds and rustling leaves filling the air with the music of the great outdoors. As evening approached, I made my way back to camp, the setting sun casting long, eerie shadows that danced across the forest floor. I built a fire, the crackling flames a reassuring companion against the backdrop of encroaching darkness. Satisfied, I retired to my tent, zipping it shut and cocooning myself in my sleeping bag. I was teetering on the edge of sleep when a noise snapped me to attention a low, rumbling growl that seemed to reverberate through the very fabric of the tent. Straining my ears, I listened as the growling was joined by footsteps, heavy and deliberate, circling my campsite. Heart pounding, I carefully unzipped my tent and peered out, clutching the pocket knife I always brought on camping trips. My eyes adjusted to the darkness, scanning the periphery of the campfire's glow. And then I saw it. Standing on two legs at the edge of the clearing was a figure unlike any animal I had ever seen. Covered in dark, shaggy fur, it had the body of a man, but the head of a wolf, its eyes glowing a strange yellow. The dog man, the stuff of Michigan legend, materialized before me in a vision of terror I could hardly comprehend. It snarled, revealing a row of razor-sharp teeth, 
and it took a step closer. My body was paralyzed with fear, yet my survival instinct screamed at me to act. In one fluid motion, I grabbed a burning log from the fire with my gloved hand and hurled it at the creature, the flames lighting up its monstrous face as it let out a guttural howl of surprise and fury. Seizing the moment, I scrambled out of my tent, pocket knife in hand, and made a break for it, my footsteps pounding in rhythm with my racing heart. I ran without direction, dodging trees and leaping over fallen logs, driven by adrenaline and the visceral need to escape. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I broke through the tree line and stumbled onto a road, gasping for air and trembling from head to toe. A passing motorist, sensing my distress, pulled over and offered me a ride. Their concerned questions met with my incoherent ramblings about a creature in the woods. Back in the safety of civilization, the encounter took on the hazy quality of a nightmare, the details blurring around the edges, but the terror remaining vividly real. I knew I had experienced something beyond the realm of human understanding, a brush with a legend that had suddenly, horrifyingly, become my own reality. From that day on, the Michigan woods became a place of both awe and caution, a reminder to me that some myths are rooted in truths too unsettling to fully grasp. I still venture into the great outdoors, but with a newfound respect for what it holds and the realization that the dogman is more than just a tail whispered around campfires. It's a living, breathing entity that walks the line between man and beast, forever lurking in the shadows of the Michigan wilderness. In the heart of Michigan, where the dense woods serve as a living canvas of ever-changing foliage and elusive wildlife, locals often whisper tales of a creature known only as the Dogman. Half man, half wolf, it is a legend that strikes both curiosity and dread into the hearts of those who venture into the wilderness. As for me, a woman with a passion for the great outdoors and a healthy skepticism of local myths, I would soon find myself entangled in the fabric of this tale. Equipped with a trusty tent, camping gear, and my loyal German Shepherd Max, I set off for a weekend retreat in the Manistee National Forest. The drive was peaceful, the hum of the engine accompanied by the melodic serenade of birdsong filtering through the open windows. By late afternoon, I found the perfect spot a clearing by a serene lake, hidden from the world by a curtain of trees and towering pines. After pitching my tent and building a campfire, I sat by the lake, losing myself in the reflections of the twilight sky on the water. Max, ever vigilant, stood by my side, his eyes scanning the surroundings, as if he sensed something that I couldn't. I laughed off his behavior, tossing a stick for him to fetch, and snapping some pictures with my camera. The first inkling that something was amiss came as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of indigo and obsidian. An eerie howl echoed through the trees, a sound that seemed neither fully animal nor human. Max growled low in his throat, his body tense, eyes fixed on the darkening woods. Unsettled but not yet afraid, I decided to retreat to the safety of my tent. With Max beside me, I zipped it, tucking myself into my sleeping bag while leaving my flashlight and pocket knight within arm's reach, just in case. In the dead of night, I was awakened by the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, and heavy. Max's low growl filled the tent as he bared his teeth, staring at the fabric walls as if he could see through it. 
My heart pounding, I grabbed my flashlight and pocket knife and unzipped the tent cautiously, my hands shaking with a mixture of cold and fear. What I saw in that moment will haunt me forever. Bathed in the pale light of my flashlight was a creature standing on two legs, its body covered in dark fur, its eyes glowing an unnatural yellow. It was the dog man, the living, breathing embodiment of Michigan's most unsettling legend. Our eyes met and a chill ran down my spine. It wasn't just the appearance of the creature that frightened me, it was the intelligence I saw in its eyes, a malevolent cunning that hinted at something far more terrifying than any wild animal. Before I could react, Max lunged at the creature, snapping and growling with a ferocity I'd never seen in him. The dog man let out a snarl of frustration, or perhaps surprise, and for a moment, just a moment, it seemed to reconsider. It was that momentary distraction that gave me the chance to act. I shouted loudly, my voice tinged with desperation, and hurled my pocket knife at the creature. Miraculously, it hit its mark, and the dogman let out a low howl of pain, or perhaps anger, retreating into the dark depths of the forest. I quickly grabbed Max, zipped up my tent, and sat there, trembling in the silence that followed. A silence that felt like the world holding its breath. When dawn finally broke, I packed up my camp as quickly as I could, leaving behind the tranquility of the lake for the harsh reality of the known world. I never reported my encounter, but I also never returned to those woods. The experience forever changed me, shattering my skepticism and leaving me with an unshakable respect for the stories and legends that shape our understanding of the wilderness. The Michigan woods are a place of beauty, but they are also a realm where myths walk on four legs, or sometimes two, and where the line between the natural and the supernatural is eternally blurred. I had always been captivated by Nevada's rugged beauty, its juxtaposition of barren deserts and bustling cities. When I finally bought a small ranch-style home in a secluded area near Carson City, I felt like I was fulfilling a dream. I was told by the previous owner that the house had character, a term I initially took to mean its rustic charm and decades-old architecture. Within a few days of moving in, however, I started to notice some odd occurrences. It began with flickering lights in the hallway and kitchen. Probably just old wiring, I thought. But then I'd hear footsteps on the wooden floors at night, when I was sure I was alone. One evening, I was in my home office, flipping through some paperwork. Suddenly, I felt an inexplicable drop in temperature. Just as I was about to shrug it off, I heard a loud crash from the living room. I rushed in to find a vase that had been sitting on the mantel, now shattered on the floor. No windows were open, nothing else was out of place. Unsettled, I began talking to locals about the house's history. That's when I learned about its former occupant, a reclusive man named Charles, who had died under mysterious circumstances many years ago. Some said he was involved in the occult. Others insisted he had been a harmless, if somewhat peculiar, loner. What everyone agreed on was that he had been deeply attached to the house. Determined to get to the bottom of the haunting, I set up cameras around the house and an audio recorder in the living room where most of the disturbances seemed to occur. For days, I captured nothing out of the ordinary. But one night, as I was reviewing the audio, I heard it. A faint whisper saying, get out. I felt a chill run down my spine, but refused to be scared out of my own home. I decided to confront the entity directly. 
armed with a sense of resolve, I stood in the middle of the living room and spoke. Charles, if that's you, I mean you no harm. We can coexist peacefully in this house. The room went cold. I felt a rush of air pass by me, like a sigh of relief. From that moment on, the disturbances ceased. No more flickering lights, no more footsteps, no more broken vases, of which there had been many. However, every so often, I still feel a cold spot in the house or hear very faint footsteps, as if Charles is reminding me of his presence. I have come to think of him as the house's guardian spirit, an unseen roommate in our shared living space. And so I continue to reside in my home, cohabitating with a spectral presence that, like the stark Nevada landscape, has its own kind of haunting beauty. We live in a delicate balance, a mutual understanding that has turned a haunted house into a home. The house still has character, but now I understand what that truly means. It's a place where the veil between the living and the dead seems thinner, a place where the past refuses to be completely forgotten, a place that both Charles and I call home. The radio looked like it belonged in another era. Wooden casing, weathered dials, the sheer heft of it a testament to its age. When I saw it at the yard sale, the nostalgia was too much to resist. Ten bucks and a cloud of dust later, I was back at my apartment, setting it up on my coffee table. I wasn't expecting much, maybe a couple of garbled channels if I was lucky. But when I turned the dial, what I heard sent chills down my spine. It was the unmistakable timber of my grandfather's voice, announcing the date as October 15th, 1965. At first I thought it was some sort of prank or trick. My grandfather had been a radio announcer, yes, but he had passed away years ago. The more I listened, the more I became convinced it was him. His tone, his phrasing, the unique way he pronounced certain words. The broadcast covered mundane topics, some news updates, a baseball game commentary, but interspersed between segments were personal remarks that only he and I would understand. Little sayings, family jokes, names of people we both knew. I sat there, entranced as his voice filled the room. It was as though a portal had been opened linking two moments separated by decades. I wanted to reach through, to talk back, to tell him everything I never got a chance to say. The radio seemed tethered to that specific date, October 15th, 1965. Turning the dial didn't change the channel, only the volume. My phone couldn't pick up any signal when I tried to record the broadcast, and nobody else could hear it when I invited them over. It was as if the radio and I had a private connection, one that defied explanation. I spent nights just sitting there, absorbed in the conversation from the past. My grandfather's voice became a constant presence in my life, a link to a time and a person that were both long gone. The isolation it brought was both comforting and eerie. There was something profoundly unsettling about listening to a voice I knew belonged to someone no longer alive, as though I was eavesdropping on a moment that wasn't meant for me. And then one day, the radio fell silent. I don't know what happened. I tried everything, changed the wiring, replaced the tubes, but it remained mute. My grandfather's voice that had filled my lonely nights was gone. I keep the radio on my bookshelf now, a relic more than anything else. Occasionally, I'll turn the knob, hoping to hear that familiar voice once again. But all I get is static. However, every year on October 15th, I sit down in front of that silent piece of technology. And for a moment, 
I can almost hear him. A grandfather. Speaking to me from another time. Another place. Another life. I've been an Alaskan fisherman for over two decades, hauling in everything from salmon to halibut, in waters both placid and treacherous. But there's a spot out there in the Gulf of Alaska locals call the Keepsake Hole, where you don't catch fish. You catch fragments of lives that have been lost or forgotten. You'll hear about it in hushed conversations at the local bars, eyes meeting just long enough to confirm that yes, we all know it exists, but we don't venture there. Out of respect, or maybe fear. I'd managed to avoid it for most of my career, dismissing it as mere lore. That was until last August, when a thick fog rolled in and my compass spun wildly, as if caught in an invisible magnetic storm. When the nets finally surfaced, they weren't filled with the day's catch. Instead, I hauled up a jumbled mass of personal items. Old leather boots, waterlogged letters sealed in plastic bags, tarnished watches stopped at different times. Each item weighed heavy with history, heavy with stories swallowed by these cold waters. It wasn't just the physical weight, it was the emotional burden, the realization that these items were all that was left of people who'd ventured into these treacherous waters and never returned. My hand shook as I picked up a letter, still legible under the plastic cover. It was addressed but never sent. A final love note from someone named Tim to his wife Helen. I didn't read it. That was someone's private moment, a message in a bottle that had never reached its destination. I gently placed it back among the other relics my fingers brushing against a rusty pocket watch, its hands frozen at 317. There was an eerie silence, as if the ocean itself was holding its breath, watching to see what I'd do next. I made my choice. I took a photograph of the items, a silent witness to this phenomenon, then lowered the net back into the water, watching as the objects sank into the abyss, returning to their watery vault. I reset my bearings and steered the boat away from that haunted spot, my heart pounding in a rhythm that felt like a second heartbeat, one that wasn't mine. When I finally reached the harbor, the other fishermen looked at me with knowing eyes. No words were exchanged, none were needed. I still fish, braving the icy swells and unpredictable currents, but I steer clear of the keepsake hole that surreal pocket where the ocean hoards its stolen treasures. I've learned to respect the boundaries that nature has set, to listen to stories that are told in hushed tones over pints of beer, because some stories are meant to serve as warnings, some boundaries as limits that should never be crossed. The ocean is a keeper of secrets, of lives lived and lost, of love notes never delivered. I can still see those objects, clear as day. Every time I close my eyes, a haunting tableau of lives interrupted. A silent testament to the ocean's uncanny ability to take away, and yet, in a strange way, preserve. So if you ever find yourself in Alaskan waters, fishing net filled with memories instead of fish, you've found it, the keepsake hole. And like me, you'll have a choice to make. Claim those relics as your own, or let them sink back into the depths where they came from, respecting the ocean's right to keep what it has claimed. I've always been a big fan of camping trips, and for my birthday, I decided to head to Crater Lake in Oregon. If you've never been, let me tell you, the place is breathtaking. But after what I saw, it's not just the beauty that will take your breath away. 
Two nights ago, after spending the day hiking and exploring the trails, I set up my camp on the northwest side of the lake. I had heard about the mirror-like reflection the lake offers under a moonlit sky, and boy, I wasn't disappointed. It was around 1 a.m., and the sheer stillness of the water, paired with the vastness of the starry sky, was a scene straight out of a painting. But then, something unusual caught my eye. A soft, greenish hue began to shimmer from the middle of the lake. At first, I thought it was bioluminescence or some kind of reflection, but the light began to rise, hovering above the water. Soon, the green light expanded and took the shape of an arc, pulsating gently. Now, Crater Lake is deep, the deepest in the US, in fact, and legends say it's bottomless. As I looked at that arc of light, I could see something beneath it in the water, like a shadow or an outline. The form began to ascend, and as it emerged from the water, the light turned intensely bright, forcing me to shield my eyes. I wish this was where the story ended, but it's not. From this illuminated craft, or whatever it was, beams of blue and white light shot out, scanning the surroundings. One of those beams landed on my campsite. It was icy cold, and I felt an odd sensation, like I was being lifted off the ground. Panicking, I closed my eyes. When I opened them again, the light was gone. The lake was its usual serene self. But here's the thing that still has me rattled. My watch and my phone, both of which were fully charged, were now dead. And according to the campsite's log, I had been missing for five hours. To me, it felt like mere seconds. I packed up at first light and made my way back to civilization, trying to process what happened. I met a park ranger on the way out and hesitated, but I decided to mention the light. He paused, looked me dead in the eyes, and simply said, you're not the first. And then, without another word, he moved on. Hiking the Appalachian Trail had been my dream for as long as I could remember. The stretch that passes through Maine was said to be both the most beautiful and the most challenging, so I saved it for last. With my trusty backpack and hiking boots, I set off, my heart filled with excitement and a little bit of dread. I made good progress the first day, covering a significant distance as the dense Maine woods wrapped around me like an emerald embrace. It was during the second day that I stumbled upon the strange artifact, an odd-shaped rock with mysterious carvings, half buried in the ground. I didn't recognize the symbols, but they fascinated me enough to keep it as a keepsake. By nightfall of the third day, I began hearing them, the footsteps, soft but deliberate, keeping pace with me but always remaining unseen. I told myself it was just an animal, but I knew better. The footprints I found the next morning confirmed it. They were human, but much larger, almost unnaturally so. That's when I remembered an old Maine legend about the specter moose, an albino moose that was not just an animal, but a spirit of the forest. It was said to appear in times of great change a harbinger of things to come. On the fourth night, I saw it. Under the moonlight, the specter moose revealed itself. It was an incredible sight, larger than any moose I had ever seen, its white fur almost glowing in the dark. But what struck me the most were its eyes. They looked almost human, filled with a wisdom that seemed to transcend time. It gestured with its head, as if inviting me to follow. 
I hesitated, but then thought of the artifact in my pocket. Could it be related? Compelled to find out, I followed the specter moose deeper into the woods. It led me to a clearing where the moonlight revealed another set of carvings, similar to the ones on the artifact. It was a story depicting coexistence between humans and the forest, and a warning against disrupting the natural balance. As I touched the carvings, the artifact in my pocket seemed to resonate, vibrating gently as if to acknowledge its twin. The specter moose looked at me one last time, its gaze almost approving, before vanishing into the forest. I resumed my hike the next day, but something had changed. The trail was the same, the challenge as demanding as ever, but I was different. I had walked into the woods as a lone hiker, chasing a dream. I walked out with the weight of revelation that we're all part of a larger, connected system, forever bound by the stories that shape us. I left the artifact back where I found it, deciding that some things are better left untouched, their mysteries free to captivate the next wanderer brave enough to venture into the deep main woods. Havana has its own rhythm, a pulsating beat that thrives in the narrow alleys, the crowded cafes, and the colorful facades that line its streets. But beyond the city, where the sand meets the Caribbean Sea, there's a different kind of music, a melody that belongs to the night, and to the folklore that resides in the collective memory of the locals. I was drawn to it, this phenomenon that everyone spoke of but few outsiders had experienced. I took to the beach just before midnight, a bottle of rum in my hand, a cigar in my pocket, and an air of skepticism swirling around me. The moon hung like a silver crescent in the ink-black sky, casting a soft glow on the water. Waves lapped lazily at the shore, their white foam fizzling out as they retreated. I settled on a driftwood log, eyes on the horizon, ears attuned to the natural symphony of the sea. Then, as the clock hands united in their midnight embrace, it happened. A melody wafted through the salty air, a haunting tune plucked on an invisible guitar. The sound was ethereal yet precise, as if each note were being played with calculated affection. It seemed to rise from the depths of the ocean, filling the space between the sea and the stars. The locals, they told of a pirate, a corsair from the golden age of sail, who'd met his tragic end on these shores. Shipwrecked and separated from his beloved, he'd drowned in a storm while clutching a golden locket, a last memento of his lost love. They said this melody was his spirit's serenade, a nocturnal tribute that soared over the waters he'd perished in. I sat there, wrapped in the musical veil, transported by its otherworldly beauty. Each chord struck resonated with a mix of sorrow and yearning, as if the pirate spirit was burying its soul, reliving a love that could never be reclaimed yet refused to be forgotten. As abruptly as it started, the melody ceased. The sounds of the ocean rushed back in, reclaiming their dominion. But the atmosphere had changed, the beach felt fuller, as though it had been momentarily inhabited by a presence that transcended human lifetimes, an emotion that defied the constraints of language. I left the beach that night with more than grains of sand clinging to my shoes. I carried away the echo of a melody, the ghost of a story, and a newfound respect for the thin membrane that separates the explainable from the mysterious. In a land known for its vibrant music, its lively dances, and its rich history, that midnight melody stands apart, a haunting refrain that links the past to the present, folklore to reality, and above all love to loss. 
The locals may attribute it to a pirate's restless spirit, but to me, it represents something more universal. The enduring power of love and music to transcend the boundaries of time and death, forever imprinted on the canvas of the Cuban beach, forever echoing in the chambers of the heart. When I moved to Vancouver for my job as a tech consultant, I was assigned to an office in the heart of historic Gastown. Unlike the sleek modern buildings that dominate the city's skyline, Gastown, with its cobblestone streets and vintage architecture, retains a sense of history. And within that history, one of the most intriguing stories is about Gassy Jack, the area's legendary founder and the steam clock that stands on Water Street. Folklore has it the Gassy Jack spirit still wanders around Gastown, making sure things are running smoothly. Legend also tells of an ethereal keeper of time, a phantom clocksmith who tends to the steam clock. Said to be a friend of Gassy Jack in life, the keeper of time purportedly ensures that the clock never falters, a guardian of temporal order in a constantly changing world. I heard these stories from my colleagues and local shopkeepers, always accompanied by a chuckle, but everything changed one foggy winter evening as I was leaving the office. It was already dark outside, and the mist was so dense that I could barely see a few feet ahead. Walking by the steam clock, I noticed something odd. The hands were stuck at 11.59. This was unusual because the clock, powered by a steam engine and supposedly looked after by the mythical keeper, was famous for its punctuality. Just as I took out my phone to check the time, I heard a soft clanking noise behind me. Turning around, I saw an elderly man with white hair and a bushy beard, tinkering with the clock's mechanism. Dressed in an old-fashioned waistcoat and a bowler hat, he looked like someone straight out of the 19th century. Stuck, is it? I ventured. Ah, just a minor hiccup, he said without looking up. Time is a tricky thing to manage, you see. As he worked, the clock emitted a loud hiss and started to chime. It was exactly midnight. The hands moved again, and the mist suddenly lifted, as if respecting the clock's authority. The elderly man wiped his hands on a cloth and smiled at me. There we go, all set. Time marches on, as it should. Are you the keeper of time? I asked, half jokingly. He chuckled. Oh, I've been called many things. A guardian, a keeper, a clocksmith, but names are fleeting. It's the work that endures. And then, almost as if he was evaporating into the air, he stepped back into the mist and disappeared. I blinked in disbelief and stared at the clock. It was functioning perfectly. I can't explain what happened that night, but it turned me into a believer. Every time I walk past the steam clock now, I think of that mysterious figure and the folklore of Gastown. The keeper of time, if he was indeed that, had taught me something profound. In a world obsessed with the future, there's value in being the guardian of the present moment. For whether it's a bustling modern city or a cobblestoned relic of the past, every place has its keepers, its guardians, its folklore. And sometimes you don't need to see to believe. You just need to take the time to listen to the stories, the chimes, and the whispers of history that guide us through the complexities of modern life. I've been camping my entire life. Deserts, mountains, forests. I thought I'd seen it all. 
But Maine offered a different kind of solitude, an untouched landscape dotted with old Native American rock paintings that promised more than just a weekend away. It offered an opportunity to truly test myself. The challenge was simple, survive a week in the deep woods with minimal supplies. Day one passed without a hitch. I set up a basic camp, caught some fish and started a fire. As the evening wore on, I admired the rock paintings near my campsite. Figures of men and animals, but also of winged creatures that looked almost divine. That night, something changed. I woke up to find my camp disturbed. My food supply was nearly gone. Had it been an animal? Or perhaps another camper? But no, I was miles away from the nearest trail. A feeling of unease settled over me. On the second night, it happened again, but this time, I heard flapping wings and thunderous cries that shook the ground. Frightened, I clutched my knife and peered into the darkness. Nothing. By the third day, exhaustion was setting in, yet a curious feeling of anticipation overwhelmed me. I found more rock paintings. These depicted what looked like a giant bird locked in combat with human warriors. Thunderbird, the legend said, a powerful spirit creature of Native American folklore. On the final night, I heard the flapping wings again. This time, they were louder, closer. Summoning my courage, I stepped out of my tent and looked up. What I saw was magnificent and terrifying. A colossal bird, its feathers shimmering with an ethereal glow, its eyes like burning coals. It circled above me, and then, with a powerful cry that echoed through the woods, disappeared into the night sky. Morning light revealed no evidence of my nocturnal visitor, but the feeling of awe remained. I had completed the challenge, but I realized the true test was not of my survival skills, but of my ability to face the unknown, to coexist with something greater than myself. As I packed up, I felt a newfound sense of respect, not just for nature, but for the ancient myths and legends that had lived long before me. I walked away from that week not just as a camper, but as someone who had been touched by something far older and far more mysterious than I had ever imagined. And so I left the forest, a place that had frightened yet enlightened me, knowing that the legend of the Thunderbird was real, at least for those willing to look beyond the veil of the ordinary world.